just in case, is there Sergei Zagaruyka in the room? Because I don't know him personally. Uh, seems no, and I don't see him online. Okay, then, well, we need to start. So let me act as a session chair then, at, at least for some, for some time. So um, uh, we have a computer vision session right now. And uh, uh, the first talk uh, will be by... Razan Dibo, and it will be on some uh, cool computer vision with X-ray images. So, uh, Razan, can you please try sharing your screen and also say something? Yeah. yeah, good morning. Good morning, we hear you very well. Yeah, it's perfect, please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so, good morning, esteemed IS attendees. It's a truly an honor to present in front of such a distinguished audience today. My name is Razan, and I'm delighted to share with you insights from our project titled Deep Lock, Deep Learning Based Bone Pathology Localization and Classification in Wrist X ray Images. So, in fact, bone diseases are a common and serious problem. According to statistics, there's around 1.5 million cases suffer from fractures due to the bone diseases. Also, it was found that the fractures of the wrists have the highest frequency of misdiagnosis, accounting for 32% of all the cases. It's important to note that the manual analysis of X-ray images is time consuming, even for experienced doctors. Also, bad quality images may hide some important details for the diagnosis. Furthermore, the experience of the radiologists is a key factor of the error probability. All in all, the problem can be seen as the detection of wrist bone diseases is manual, time consuming with high probability of errors. And that's why there is a high motivation to automate this process. So our goal in this project is to increase the speed and the efficiency of the diagnostic procedure. As we can see here, this will be the input image for our model. It will take several minutes from doctors to evaluate the image while it will take less than a second using our model to evaluate it and drawing these bounding boxes around the injured areas. The objectives of this project were to, first of all, implement the YOLO version architecture to the modified data set that I will explain later, then trying to enhance the results by adding a tension mechanism and then trying to add a transformers, a visual transformers, and finally to combine all of these techniques together which they are the attention mechanism with the swing transformer with YOLO version seven, and finally fine tune the final architecture. So before start talking about the proposed approach, let me first introduce what is this swing transformer. It stands for shifted windows, and it's basically a vision transformer variant, but the idea here is that it is with hierarchical way of processing the image. So it's like any visual transformer, it still relies on patches, but instead of choosing one size and sticking with it through all the layers, instead, the swing transformer first starts with a small batch size and it will uh, try to merge them together into bigger ones as we go deeper in the transformer layers. And here you can find each of these transformer block it consists of the shifted window multi-head self-attention model, followed by a two light layer perceptron. And also we have the layer normalization before each one of them with the residual connections. Talking about the attention mechanisms, actually there are different attention mechanisms that were suggested to use either what's called the channel attention or maybe the spatial attention in a way that to su suppress the important channels. So there's only one study, it's called CBAM, which is convolutional block attention model, which considered both the spatial and the channel attention together sequentially. But the problem of this study is that it ignored the channel spatial interactions. I mean that sometimes we have a common or um, uh, across dimension information. So in CBAM, they lose this cross dimension information. So to amplify these cross-dimension interactions, the GAM, which is Global Attention Mechanism, was proposed, which is capable of capturing the significant features across all the three dimensions. As you can see here, we start, before going to the channel attention, we start with this permutation. 
It's a 3D permutation to preserve the information across the three dimensions. And we also have the multi-layer perceptron, two-layer multi-layer perceptron to amplify this cross-dimension information. And then we have the spatial submodel, which is the two convolution layers for spatial information fusion. Now we can talk about the proposed approach. So as we can see here, YOLO version 7 was used as baseline. So the YOLO version 7 is made up of three main components. We have the head, neck, and the backbone. Sometimes they merge the head with the neck together. So in the backbone is where the convolution layers detect the key features of the image for the processing later. The main convolution layer here is called ELAN, which is Effective Layer Aggregation Network, which uses group convolution to increase the cardinality of the added features and try to combine features of different groups in a shuffle and merge cardinality manner. So this way of operation can enhance the features learned by different feature maps and improve the use of the parameters and the calculations later. Then we have the neck. In the neck, it takes these features from the backbone into the fully connected layer, which are in the heads. Uh, so finally, to predict the bounding boxes, coordinates, and the classification probabilities. So the final output layer here, which is the head, it makes the prediction, as we can see, at three different uh, levels. So the key important thing here is that it improves the model's ability to detect small objects, medium objects, and small sized objects. So if you can notice these red boxes, you can find that we suggested to use or to insert the swing transformer and gamma tension before each of the detection heads. And of course, now you are wondering why in this position exactly. So let me first uh, describe the data set before answering this question. We used pediatric wrist trauma X-ray data set, which has nine classes. And here you can find some uh, samples for different classes. It has around 20,000 images with doctors and notations, which are the bounding boxes and the diseases. The classes are the diseases. But after discussion with doctors in hospitals, we decided to modify this data set to get only four classes. We kept both of uh, fracture and periosteal reaction classes as, as it is, and we merged two classes, which are the foreign body and metal, into one class, we called it a foreign body, and the other classes, we called all of them a bone lesion, which includes uh, soft tissue, pronocyne, and other diseases. And also we deleted an, an important class for the doctors, which is the text, which is the letter here, R or L, uh, that's for the right or the left hand. So after this modification, we found the performance on this modified data set. It was divided into training, validation, and testing set by 70, 20, 10% respectively. And the results are shown in the table. So uh, the average precision metric is used to evaluate and compare the different models together. Before starting doing the experiments, all of the experiments, we have to find out first, what is the best pre-processing and augmentation technique? We've tried different techniques like the unsharp masking with different filters, Clahi filter, and also a mix we called our, our technique mix, which involved resizing the original data set to 640 by 640. We applied the mosaic mix up rotation and horizontal flipping. And in terms of this mean average precision, you can find that uh, you can see that it has the best result among all the other reprocessing techniques. Also, we tried to find where is the best place to insert the gamma tension. So we've tried it before each of the heads separately and before all of the heads, and we compared the result with the CBAM because theoretically we say that gamma tension is better than CBAM, but we have to see this in experiments. And actually, yes, it was better in terms of the mean average precision, but if we compare this before all the heads with each one of the heads, we can see that there's um, a small difference. It's not a, a, a very big difference here. So here you can find a table that compares different models. We've tried the YOLO itself. We tried with the CPAM attention, with gamma attention. We've tried to insert only the spin transformer before the heads. And we also tried if it's okay to insert this swing transformer 
even in the backbone. And finally, we try to mix all of these techniques together, the YOLO with the SWIN with the CPAM and YOLO with the SWIN with GAM, which we call it the deep lock because it's the winner model. And you can see in terms of the average precision of each of the classes that it has the best results, even with the mean average precision, it has 0.65. We also compared between different models in terms of the number of parameters, gigaflops, layers, and inference time. And of course, as much as we add layers and we add like models to this architecture, these parameters will be increased. The number of layers will be increased even of there, even the inference time, it, it increased a little bit, but it's still considerable. Here you can find a comparison between uh, the YOLO itself and our modified, uh, or the winner model, deep lock, in terms of the, the uh, precision recall curve. And specifically talking about the curve that's related to the pawn legend class, you can find a real enhancement using our suggested idea. And also in terms of the mean for all of the curves, there's also an enhancement. For the application study, we've tried to find uh, what is the effect of rotating the images with different angles. So for each of the classes, so for the degree, for the angles 5, 15, and 30 degrees, there's somehow it's a close to our uh, results. But with, uh, if we use this, the 60 degrees rotations, it resulted in a notably inferior mean average precision score. And this is due to the increased degree of the distortion and the deformation introduced to the image data. And in this table, you can find the detailed uh, <coughs> results for the precision and recall for the winner model for all of the classes and each one separately. Now let's see a real images to see how the effect of our winner model. So using YOLO itself for this, for this image, you can see that it wrongly predicts uh, the edges of this image as foreign bodies. While this problem wasn't exist in our modified version, it, it um, predicted correctly that there's a fracture. So let me tell you here that the uh, blue uh, bounding boxes are the grounded truth and the other colors is the, the predicted by the model. Another example here using the YOLO, it was able to predict only one of the two, you see here two classes of the period reaction, while in our modified version, it was, to it was able to predict both classes together correctly. And also here's a very important example because using YOLO, it wasn't able to predict any of the grounded truth of the pawn legend. This is while using the winner model, you can find that even though it's only one class, but somehow the region or the bounding box, it covers all of these bounding boxes together. We also tried to test our model on some external data from the hospital. Actually, the, doctor, the doctors were uh, interested in the fracture uh, disease only. So you can find here that the model was able to predict that there's a fracture correctly, even though it was somehow covered by this metal thing. And uh, exactly the same here with a very good accuracy. Also, this is a very important example because even experienced doctors weren't able to uh, find that there's a fracture here because this is an example of a body quality image. While the model was able to predict that there's a fracture here and here. So as a conclusion, I can say that uh, Applying YOLO itself enhanced the state-of-the-art results by 6%. When we add the gamma tension mechanism with the swing transformer, we have another uh, positive impact on the detection results by 8%. We found that the position of the attention mechanism um, had a relatively small impact on the result. And it's good to notice that we still have limited amount of pawn legend class images, and this affected negatively the average precision result. So of course, adding new images to the data set will definitely improve the results. For the future work, um, I can say that uh, if we expand the data set and explore more um, uh, like uh, transformers or even um, attention mechanisms, these are like important areas, areas for the further experiments. And thank you so much.
Dear colleagues, do we have, okay, we have questions. Okay, start with Evgeny. Uh, thank you for the talk. I have two questions in particular. Uh, like, uh, first question is, uh, unfortunately, YOLO V7 is, uh, have like a low research only license, so like no hospital could use it for free. Uh, could you please tell me whether uh, replacing this with uh, some alternatives uh, or earlier versions will affect the result a lot or is more or less the same? Could you please comment on that? <laughs> Yeah, thanks for the question. Actually, actually, I didn't know that it is um, uh, it's limited to use, but uh, I think yeah, if we if you want to uh, use alternatives, if, of course it will affect the result because the, the baseline that we that we used is the YOLO version seven. But actually, I've tried also using the YOLO version five and YOLO version eight even, but YOLO version seven has the best results on this data set. Uh, uh, can you comment like what's the difference between V5 and V7? Because V5 is at least for now <laughs> more or less free. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think the the dif main difference is using the ELAN and also in the detection heads uh, the sizes of uh, of the anchor proxies to find the small and medium and l the large objects in this in the image itself. Uh, okay, thank you. A, a second small question. So, uh, like, uh, image augmentation really uh, helps uh, in the computer vision. So, like, uh, different approaches like run, augment, and stuff. Uh, my question is, uh, are there specific augmentations that could be used for X-ray images? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, yes, actually, I used something called mosaic uh, augmentation technique. In this technique of augmentation, you know that when you have uh, an X-ray images, an X-ray image, sometimes the object is in the center of the image. But when you use this mosaic technique, uh, the mosaic technique you combine many images together in the same image. So in this way, you have objects in different areas of the of the image itself. Thank you. I had one more question. Uh, thank you for your talk and simple question just uh, which framework did you use for for the for the, for your models to build your models uh do you mean the pytorch yeah pytorch or like something else yeah, yeah pytorch pytorch okay and uh, another simple question maybe i was a bit too late uh, just to clarify what's the the amount of of uh, samples in the training data uh, we have 20,000 images, so 70% of them uh, are for the training data. So 13,000? 13,000? No, 20. 20,000. Ah, 20, okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, colleagues, uh, if anyone will have further questions, we have a course of this paper, Alec, here, so we will ask later. And uh, let us thank Razan again. Thanks a lot for a great talk. And uh, Thank now, you so we, much. now we proceed. So, our next talk is, uh, uh, is on greedy algorithms for, fi for fast finding of uh, curvilinear symmetry of binary raster images. My name is Nikita Lomov, and uh, in this report, I represent Tula State University and uh, my, the title of my report is Grid Algorithm for Fast Finding Cur Curvilinear Symmetry of Binary Raster Images. So let me start from the field of our activity. It is analysis of symmetry of planar forms. And uh, <clears throat> it is uh, intuitively clear that uh, the planar shape is symmetric when we can cut it into two halves and they will be equal, but the problem is that when we take a photo shooting of some uh, object from real life, uh, it will be noise applied, it will be <clears throat> deviations uh, caused by the point of view or some pose, some occlusions. And uh, so usually we can't uh, can I talk about uh, pure symmetry in uh, real life images? We can talk about quasi symmetry or 
uh, approximate symmetry and uh, of course we can see that all the subjects that produce these uh, binary silhouettes are intrinsically symmetric but uh, sometimes uh, their shape is affected by pose and uh, for example <clears throat> for this alligator it is uh, it its pose can be expressed as some sort of curved line and uh, we need some straighten, straightening procedure and uh, algorithm for finding this cur curved line uh, to <clears throat> make a conclusion that our initial object was really symmetric. In fact, the task of uh, obtaining uh, symmetry of planar object is uh, is uh, well analyzed. There are uh, bunches of approaches and they can be divided into two main parts. Uh, one part is uh, counter-oriented and the second one is uh, interior-oriented. And uh, in the first class of approaches, there is uh, some <coughs> procedure for comparing uh, parts of counter, for example, we are assessing Fourier transform or maybe finding some critical points and the problem with these approaches is uh, that sorry uh, uh, is that uh, the estimation the number that expresses the quality of our symmetry is hardly interpretable so it's just uh, some distance in Fourier space or some discrepancy in critical points, so we need maybe something more accessible and more intuitively clear. And uh, another class of approaches is uh, interior oriented and uh, for example, uh, our last research was uh, about uh, this class and uh, there, there are for example mechanisms for <clears throat> calculating the best transform uh, according to Jacquard measure. So we just reflect our image and uh, we overlay them. And uh, in fact, it is just uh, intersection over union measure <clears throat> well known in, for example, segmentation by neural networks. So we can at first uh, analyze our projections we are a transform and uh, of course for symmetric uh, shape uh, these pro projections will be symmetric as functions uh, too and uh, the more advanced approach is connected to any possible affin transforms of our image so we can we can find optimal solution for uh, jacquard measure and optimal parameters for straightening and symmetrizing our image uh, for uh, all possible affin transformations. And uh, for this part, I can conclude that it is all about the parameterization of our transform. So, in fact, uh, the real task is how to find transform that uh, makes our image symmetric uh, according to vertical axis, for example. So uh, it is uh, it is uh, clear for strict symmetry. We just need to rotate and shift our image, and uh, for curved symmetry, the task is much more complicated because we can, of course, express uh, our curved line by splines or by some <clears throat> uh, some points uh, via Bezier curve and so on. But uh, it's uh, too hard to optimize. And uh, the task of searching for curved symmetry is uh, very well established in uh, bioinformatics. For example, the analysis of worms or uh, fishes and so on. And sometimes uh, there are different representations of our images because uh, of the nature of photo shooting procedure. Sometimes we cannot, for example, cannot get uh, the whole outline of our object we can just obtain some 
point cloud and we need to approximate our curve plan through this point cloud. <clears throat> yes, and our first approach uh, for this task was dedicated to dynamic programming. So we can express uh, our curve line just as a sequence of steps uh, with the uh, with a small angle. And uh, we can compute the optimal solution for this. Uh, but uh, we have two problems. The first one is that this approach is too time consuming because we, in fact, in dynamic programming should check all possible lines, even if we can stitch stitch the parts of them uh, we are dy dynamic programming paradigm it is still too <clears throat> it is still too tedious and time consuming and uh, uh, another problem is that we need to forbid cycles in our trajectories and it uh, implies too hard restrictions of our our possible curves so we need uh, somehow to improve it uh, to access a better speed and a better and a better flex flexibility of our line. Okay. So what's the idea of straightening? We just uh, draw some perpendiculars uh, evenly distributed uh, along our uh, curve and uh, we just uh, fill our straightened image row by row along these uh, perpendiculars. So the approach of straightening will be the same, in fact, but the approach of constructing our line will be completely different. It will be constructed with a <clears throat> greedy approach. So it is the same sequence of steps, but uh, of course we trace uh, only one line and maybe with some range of possible directions in every step. And uh, as I saw, we use a Jacquard measure as a measure of our, sim our symmetry. And uh, we can apply Jacquard measure not uh, to the whole image, but uh, to the line. So we can, so we have some segment and uh, some point in this line. and. Uh, <laughs> We can compare the left side and the right side of this segment and uh, to compare the lens and uh, it will be some partial uh, Jacquard measure along the, this perpendicular and from these partial measures the total measure will be collected. So in, in, in fact uh, to our approach is simple, so we start with some user predefined or maybe some point extracted from the skeleton uh, on the boundary of our object and uh, we take some steps and uh, on every every step we can adjust the direction just using our Jacquard measure and uh, with some penalty of deviation from the past direction and uh, we trace our line uh, with adaptive choose of step and adaptive choose of possible range of angles uh, <clears throat> until we will leave the interior of our object. So we will go out of the image itself or out of the black part. So, and there are a lot of formulas and uh, it's maybe too, too uh, time consuming to explain everything, but maybe uh, this one is uh, most, most interesting. So it's uh, just a measure for choosing the proper angle and it, uh, it contains of three terms. So it is uh, proportional of Jacquard measure. So it's uh, just local measure of symmetry along our future perpendicular. And uh, uh, square root of cosinus alpha uh, to penalize, <coughs> penalize rotations from the past direction. So if uh, the direction will be the same, so the rotation angle will be zero and uh, it uh, just squashes to 
unit. And uh, the, in the denominator, we have some <coughs> factors just uh, uh, length of our perpendicular, but uh, the portion of width line inside the figure. So uh, it uh, states that our method prefers uh, stepping into rather narrow parts of our shape because we faced a problem that it, is, uh, it was uh, shifted to too wide to white parts of the image, so uh, and uh, our <clears throat> our aim was to trace our shape along elongated lines, lines. and it starts uh, by uh, choosing one one principal di direction over eight evenly distributed, and uh, as uh, as of a measure of our direction, we just uh, estimate the length to the first point of the boundary. And uh, so when the boundary is far in this direction, the <coughs> direction is considered to be better. And uh, Another parameter of our algorithm is a step. It is uh, can it uh, possesses the procedure for adapted, adaptive choose of step. So it's uh, just the square root of this distance to the boundary. And uh, yes. when <clears throat> when the distance to the boundary is short, so our algorithms uh, began begin to be more accurate and uh, more and uh, less risky as i can say and when the boundary is far we can uh, make uh, much longer steps what's the, that's the idea and uh, the another another parameter uh, uh, tied to, with this distance is a uh, range of possible angles when we from which we can choose our direction it is also also the same idea so when uh, the distance uh, distance to the boundary point is far we not only can make large, larger steps but uh, we can afford can allow greater deviations from the last last directions because in this narrow narrow and very curved line this uh, distance will be small and uh, so the range of alpha will be much greater because we need uh, much more freedom in our curvature oh yes and uh, of course uh, after applying the straightening procedure we can access the classical jacquard measure just to between straightened and reflected image and uh, for example it should be yes it is 0777 so it is uh, pretty in fact it is uh, rather close to zero to consider this uh, image to be symmetric but uh, now we have some advanced procedures uh, just to align <coughs> The line, the other parts, not the main body, but uh, the whole uh, uh, all the parts of our lizard uh, together. Yes, and uh, the main result is uh, our algorithm is uh, <clears throat> successfully applied with white sort of images, and it have. Uh, have uh, very <coughs> a very successful speed of uh, uh, dozens of milliseconds and uh, yes it's the main 
it's uh, the main stage uh, for time consumption of our algorithm because straightening is uh, much more fast and uh, Maybe there were successful successful images, but uh, sometimes we can face the problems because uh, because as our algorithm is greedy, it can see the, it cannot see the future. So sometimes it uh, can choose a wrong direction, it, and uh, by its nature, it should follow it uh, to the end. So sometimes uh, we need to find some apex of our shape and uh, to end our curved line in it in this point but uh, before we reached it we don't know about uh, its existence and uh, it's uh, uh, example of problematic image so and uh, yes uh, we successfully successfully solved the task of searching for the current symmetry for elongated and curved binary shapes and uh, we have some prospects for future improvement for example to <clears throat> uh, to align more some more subtle parts of image and uh, to prevent cycles and uh, so on so thank you very much for attention and I'm ready to ask your questions Your colleagues, any questions? My question is from a different different angle. You can show me the strain, the straightening, strain, uh, straightening. Oh, yes, yes, of the shape straightening. Yes, uh, this question I uh, arise from me. All objects by nature are fractal in nature. Uh, could you do that? Could you define the fractality of the nature, not doing such a computation by your algorithm, but define your fractality, which will make it easier to you to understand how, because fractals and fractality is very close connected to symmetrization and the symmetry. You could do that, for example, by another algorithm and to make it easier for you to how to not that make this curved object to make it straight straight for example by shape straightening for example this object and could you do that or just a reflection and question for you it's a very broad question and it uh, for me yes it seems that uh, another Another approaches and another techniques will be more suitable for this search for fractality. For example, I think uh, that uh, graph representations with a, uh, we are skeleton. So skeleton is just a medial axis. So it is uh, <clears throat> has some sort of thinning and result of thinning our forms, and it will be a graph and. Uh, it seems that uh, we can analyze uh, the self similarity and fractal parts uh, without it, this skeletal graph, maybe. But uh, but not via this uh, this uh, rather restricted and and its uh, aims uh, procedure. Uh, any more questions, colleagues? Uh, yeah, I, I, I will also ask one question which probably I was not uh, listening that well in the beginning, but like uh, what's the ultimate goal? So yeah, you achieved that, so you, uh, you understood your shape very well, but how do you use it at the end? So I mean, what is the end application? Oh, okay, so in graphics. For example, it is a result from the past, but in biological research, for example, we need to, to get straightened texture for our object. So we have a mask in form of silhouette of binary image. And when we constructed this curved symmetry line, we can straighten it and, for example, get this straightened text textures and uh, compare them 
because it's uh, it is uh, much more uh, comfortable to deal with straightened image uh, with the same size and so on with the same coordinate system and uh, but uh, our research in fact uh, mostly theoretical inspired, theoretically inspired so we are interested in some parameterizations of symmetry some some kind every possible kind and form of symmetry uh, also as uh, symmetry in graphs and uh, symmetry in uh, uh, <clears throat> in some complicated shapes and so on okay thanks nikita and i think we have no more questions so let us thank nikita again Okay, so the next talk will be um, on handwritten text recognition and browsing in archive of prisoners' letters from Smolensk convict prison. Wow. Uh, okay, please yeah. go ahead. It was, it was completely different, completely different field and uh, topic and tasks. So we analyze historical documents because we have a, a grant of Russian scientific fund and. Uh, so it is uh, accessed to high school of, school of economics, but uh, primarily some participants are from Lomonosov Moscow State University. And uh, yes, it is about analysis of hand handwritten historical documents. And uh, of course, uh, some sort of automatic uh, machine analysis. And uh, the problem with this <clears throat> tasks is there is a lack of uh, large scale and uh, general purpose data sets of handwritten documents in Russian. There are some, of course, in English, maybe in another language, but we have just, uh, just several such data sets and uh, some of them are too simple. Uh, for example, handwritten Kazakh and Russian because it's too restricted in, in phrases and uh, its structure is just uh, forms uh, fill it with predefined words so it's uh, it uh, doesn't contain so much diversity and there is a problem and uh, but uh, there are several scripts several script styles and uh, in, in fact, we revealed that the way of writing uh, dramatically changed uh, through last century so uh, they cannot be considered and regarded historical and uh, uh, also we have some data sets uh, dedicated to historical persons for example Peter the Great and have had a uh, very very difficult and unique uh, style of handwriting and uh, of course at a it cannot be directly generalized to some historical archives because the nature of handwriting will be completely different and with different features. And, uh, but of course, uh, these data sets are <clears throat> commonly used and uh, a lot of papers uh, use them as uh, in experiments, but in practical tasks, we need to find uh, another way and uh, so uh, our basic data was uh, consisted of only 67 photographs. It's just a notebook from uh, consisting uh, <coughs> containing uh, letters from Smolensk convict prison, and uh, uh, they were <coughs> completed with the uh, same handwriting because. Uh, uh, because of the censorship, these letters were opened and rewritten by some gendarme, and uh, the <clears throat> and this uh, stability of handwriting is a great feature of our dataset. Of course, we <coughs> we extensively used it, and uh, there was a transcript, but. Uh, maybe a bit noisy uh, with uh, a lot of mistakes of uh, of uh, missing parts and uh, it was uh, some tasks on pre-processing because there are overlaid pages and uh, some parts of 
the same letter can be distributed to several pages. So, in fact, this uh, pre-processing was uh, made manually. And uh, what are possible representations of our handwritten text data in uh, practical approaches? Uh, there are be three main. It can be expressed. Uh, mm -hmm. The image can be split into individual lines and uh, aligned with text transcript. But sometimes you can uh, pass to the system of handwritten handwriting recognition. Pass the whole paragraph. Uh, it uh, it is suitable when the lines are. Uh, good aligned because uh, just uh, one over another and there are no uh, <coughs> sample some um, no marginalia no uh, lines in no portions of texts in, in between and but uh, sometimes uh, there is a possibility to <coughs> get more structured representation of a page with different paragraphs paragraphs with different types of texts but of course in uh, real applications to <clears throat> to collect uh, uh, to collect data with such a representations with all all fragments isolated and all fragments uh, market is much more tedious so we will work primarily with a uh, line and uh, paragraph representation, and uh, we will compare algorithms uh, applied to these two types. And yes, we need some preprocessing tasks to obtain these representations, and uh, it was achieved mainly by using some ready made neural networks. So. Uh, the first one is extracting uh, pen trace, uh, just doing some segmentation and uh, grayscale image. And the second one is extracting baselines. So, in, uh, also in a sort of binary image, when connect components uh, represent these baselines. Yes, and uh, the previous step can be can be made automatically, but uh, in this case we obtained that uh, uh, applying some ready-made models to extract text fragments is wasn't successful because they are overlaid and they are in the same script, so the system cannot distinguish, for example, a letter. Uh, between letter and underlying letter because they have almost the same structure. So this step was uh, taken manually and it uh, resulted in uh, 86 text fragments and uh, image fragments corresponding to parts of the same letter. Yes, and uh, to obtain our line representation we have done such a step of distributing our portions of pen trace to baselines uh, it is uh, down done by analyzing connected components so we filter out the noise the parts that are too far from our baselines and uh, distribute components according fact to majority rule but sometimes there are two or more maybe <coughs> candidates uh, when because uh, we have in our script underlined elements and uh, overlined some loops and they can be stitched and uh, so they represent the same component distributed uh, through several baselines and uh, in this case we need to cut these components into several parts and it is down and the most narrow uh, narrow parts of our pen trace uh, <coughs> just because it it corresponds to the 
places of stitching of uh, different uh, different dukes, dukes uh, different uh, uh, lines of our pen. Yeah. And uh, another pre-processing task is uh, text straighten, and it's straightened again, yes, because uh, we have some sort of rota rotation, uh, some sort of uh, <clears throat> uh, inclination if, in our text direction, and uh, it is also simple algorithm. We just need to correct our baseline. Uh, to make it uh, fully horizontal and uh, to apply the same transformation to our initial uh, colored image. And uh, the, another uh, very valuable step is to eliminate uh, the portions of pixels related to pixels of pen trace, so they are informative, but uh, related to another lines. So it uh, it achieved by analyzing the mask uh, by filling uh, pixels related to this mask uh, with the <coughs> nearest pixels in the background. So, yes, oh, without this denoising, yes, the result is much more worse that uh, denoised, uh, <coughs> denoised option in the bottom row. And uh, the same same procedure can be applied to the page as a whole. So it's, this transformation is not line, line by line, but for the page itself. Yes, and uh, it was a lot of manual work, uh, of course, uh, with preparing and transcript, because we need to achieve a full correspondence be between the image and the text to use it uh, in uh, ma machine recognition. So uh, every, every feature of the spelling, every feature of line breaking and so on, <clears throat> uh, it was uh, retaining, retained when, uh, when preparing this ground truth transcript. And uh, there are uh, some popular architectures for handwritten text recognition, and uh, we've taken uh, vertical attention on CI uh, because of uh, the <clears throat> our data set is rather narrow, so we cannot use uh, full transformers. But uh, in fact, it, it uh, contains some sort of attention mechanisms, but it is uh, just uh, expresses the distribution of our line uh, between uh, rows of the image, uh, maybe with some pulling or striding. So it is, uh, the attention in this case is uh, just a column vector vector and uh, the representation of a line is just a weighted sum of representation uh, of uh, feature representation of rows and uh, that uh, obtain it uh, via fully convolutional matter so and uh, using this approach we achieved uh, some some satisfying results uh, in terms of character error rate and uh, word error rate. And it's uh, just an example of one, one portion of text. Of course, uh, it is, uh, <clears throat> uh, this neural network itself uh, knows nothing about Russian language. It's just uh, analyzing uh, graphical structure uh, and features of our image. So there are a lot of strange mistakes and uh, a lot of words and uh, letter sequence that don't exist in the Russian language. And uh, yes, but uh, the final recognition rate was uh, slightly over 505% uh, in character error rate. And we can see that our preprocessing pre is also very valuable because without denoising, it is, it is uh, <clears throat> Uh, almost uh, seven percent of character error rate. So the denoising is uh, very valuable, and maybe the 
uh, straightening is not so very available in terms of uh, error rate, but it speeds up our network because the size of the image uh, will be uh, uh, much more lower. Okay, and so we are dealing with some sort of uh, noise and uh, uh, machine-generated output. And uh, to use it in practical tasks, we need to do some post-processing. And uh, there were two directions of this post-processing. So the first one was uh, dictionary-based and rule-based. And uh, we just transformed our <coughs> automatic transcript to modern spelling as to correcting the alphabet, uh, alphabet uh, correcting the rules for prefixes so they can be prescribed of course and uh, to make our words realistic we used some uh, dictionary based method relying on Levenstein distance and uh, make uh, limitization via an LTK library for future analysis because uh, the text should be prepared for some sort of navigation procedures. Yes. And uh, the, another direction is uh, GPT-based correction, so it uh, eliminates the process of searching for proper, <laughs> proper instruments. It's just some instruction, instruction to our board to correct our text, and uh, it, we obtain it that uh, we need to provide some more instructions not related to text correction itself but uh, for example uh, pay attention to named entities to actors in text and uh, uh, the problem was that uh, the result uh, with the initial prompt was too loose so uh, GPT can use synonyms, can use some reordering, and uh, it <coughs> it was uh, instruction to forbid this transformation transformation in text and to keep it its structure uh, as similar to the original one as possible. So yes, and uh, here. <clears throat> Our quality measure is uh, word error rate because it's uh, more <clears throat> more suitable for GPT because it can uh, correct spelling and it still makes some reordering uh, in our words. So, so when we yeah. and uh, in terms of ZER, the penalty was much more. Uh, for reordering so yes when uh, after after uh, <clears throat> improving our instruction with some examples and some role it uh, it overcomes the uh, error rate uh, achieved by dictionary based methods yes and uh, maybe one can explain that uh, GPT perfectly corrects the text. Uh, that's not the case. So we obtained some number of mistakes uh, in automatic transcription and uh, also in fact, less than half of uh, this uh, mistakenly transcripted word, words were corrected by GPT. Sometimes uh, it is uh, uh, even in case uh, when the solution seems uh, evident for human being, so we have uh, no such word as natrasne in Russian language, but it uh, kept it as is. And uh, another problem that uh, GPT produces the output is uh, one portion of a text without line breaking. So we invented some sort of dynamic program in it. Uh, it is uh, very similar to edit distance, just to <clears throat> to set line breaks in proper uh, proper place of our text. 
uh, and uh, minimize a, at a distance uh, not uh, between the whole text uh, but uh, <clears throat> with paying and attention to line break, breaks line by line and in fact it was a preparation for navigate navigation systems for our colleagues from uh, humanities uh, historians and philologists and uh, one task they are interested in is a search by keywords uh, search and topic extraction and in case that where a topic can be expressed in a set of keywords so uh, what is the <clears throat> flow of our system oh we have some automatic transcription and uh, as the system use CTC loss as uh, as the loss one training we can align uh, align our predicted text uh, distributed through columns of our image so and uh, also, we can distribute the text over lines. So we have uh, placement over x, both x-axis and y-axis, and we can make some sort of visualization just to underline uh, our found, our keywords found uh, using this placement. Yes. And there are results of our system. Uh, Oh, it uh, was a model task when uh, the expert was setting true uh, four topics expressed by sets of keywords and uh, so there are four colors corresponding to these topics and uh, we have made some sort of visualization and uh, maybe some sort of analysis of collocation as future work and uh, some uh, topic extraction. And uh, uh, the rightmost image is the visualization of our page-based uh, model. And uh, uh, we can see that uh, this placement, this highlighting is much more smoother it's just because of the nature of our attention, because it is, uh, it, uh, uh, it is a very simple distribution of uh, vertical levels. So the <clears throat> so our underlining underlining part uh, will be completely horizontal. And uh, another another possible task using the this machine generated output is search for personal names and uh, we utilize two simple approaches just to extract everything that starts with capitals and uh, to analyze some punctuation so when for example uh, this uh, capitalized uh, word starts after a dot it uh, can be not appropriate, just can be ordinary word. So we have here two, two types of highlighting uh, for ordinary words uh, capitalized and uh, uh, words that regarded as proper names. Yes. And it is interesting, but uh, uh, the search for proper words is uh, the main tasks uh, when uh, GPT-based correction was uh, uh, the most successful one. Uh, it is uh, because it corrects maybe not mainly not the particular words that, but it. Uh, describes the overall structure of the text uh, and uh, separation in sentences and to restore the capitalization much more better than correcting just spelling. Oh, uh, it is uh, maybe an unexpected conclusion in our experiments, but uh, uh, there are 
so we can use a GPT as a solution for everything. We can can search for a proper task uh, to utilize it. And uh, yes, yes, some slides for our future pro prospects. Of course, the visualizing and analyzing an archive of less than 100 images is uh, looking like a toy problem, although uh, it's uh, very it can be very helpful still. But uh, now we have uh, much more <clears throat> much more extended archive of four volumes of diaries of uh, Admiral Fedor Lidke and uh, only it uh, contains uh, several thousand pages and uh, only several hundreds uh, are mainly transcribed and uh, with uh, with uh, great artifacts, so we are planning to <coughs> transcript it automatically, and uh, we are towards towards a successful solution. And uh, the feature is that uh, notebook is aligned, so the line space uh, seems stable to our data and for in this case we can for example invent some some new type of attention for uh, equally distributed lines and uh, the another trick we utilize is uh, ctc loss with missing parts uh, the missing parts are ubiquitous in uh, this archive uh, especially when transcribing another language like uh, german and latin so we can use special symbols uh, when the real, the true character is unknown, or maybe the length of se sequence is unknown, and it still work, works and uh, still have an ability to train. So, yes, and uh, the main result of our work and is that uh, we can achieve rather satisfying the recognition rate using just uh, just uh, 1000 of lines but uh, written in the same handwriting handwriting so thank you very much and uh, thank you for your attention and interest okay thank you very much nikita uh, it was i think well project is amazing i think and uh, also your effort today is like to get the two talks it was like longer than a plenary one so it's definitely difficult uh, colleagues do we have any questions yeah Alec? thank you very much for the talk and sharing this task with us um, uh, did you use any specific and exotic augmentation techniques uh, for the training process of the ocr model here uh, something like uh, handwritten stroke augmentation or so. Thank you. Okay, there are some sort of augmentation, but it uh, it is dealing with images. Uh, so uh, all possible geometrical distortions, uh, tone corrections and so on, maybe stitching uh, parts of words from different lines together, but uh, we haven't generated new text and uh, maybe, maybe it uh, can improve the results, but uh, we have uh, struggling with it because of the <clears throat> And, uh, low amount of uh, our data, but of course it's possible. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, did you use only ch 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 GPT based model for your transcripts and uh, recognition, or for example, other models also for Anthropic, for example, Google's uh, Bart, and, and so on, Lemmas, Meta's Lemma, and so on? Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, the de dealing with uh, <clears throat> language models is uh, a task of my co-author. So it uh, it uh, 
more experienced maybe than me, but uh, it, it checked some some language model, maybe not so much, maybe three and four, and uh, uh, concluded that uh, GPT is better and uh, is the most accessible one. But uh, of course, there are a lot of tasks and uh, here and uh, every can be improved. So yes, there are a lot of a lot of open questions and uh, a lot of drawbacks in our system. These are not, not drawbacks, that's a directions for improvement. So <laughs> let's be positive. Uh, any more questions? Uh, well, if there are no more questions, and thank you, Nikita, again. <laughs> and I think that our next talk is going to be online. Uh, okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Maxim Kuprashevich. Uh, I'm computer vision team leader at uh, Layer Team, Salut Devices, and um, I am Andrew Talstich, as authors of uh, paper Mivola, uh, multi input transformer for uh, age and gender estimation. Oh, second. Okay. So let's start with uh, task definition, and um, our task can be divided into two slightly different uh, subtasks. Uh, first one is very straightforward, and uh, it's much more common. A vast of methods we're trying to solve exactly this task. So uh, let's say we have some crop of a person, and the face is visible enough uh, to be used for a prediction with our black box uh, to predict age and gender. And um, this task is, uh, I, I think, very plain and uh, very common, but there is a, um, another type of task, uh, not so many methods trying to solve it, uh, when face isn't uh, weighable or heavily occluded, but um, despite this task is not so common, it's uh, still very important for science and business, for example, for surveillance cameras or personification, or as it is in our case, uh, for a close accessories, shoes, recommendation systems. Because uh, let's say we cannot estimate gender uh, from picture at the bottom, uh, therefore we have to search through the entire index. Uh, and um, we will search, of course, for just for a visual similarity, and therefore we can easily uh, find something wrong. For example, I don't know, man uh, pants for a kid here, and of course, uh, this will be an absolute fail. So that's why uh, it's important. So our goal was to create such model that can uh, operate in both uh, cases and be as precise as possible, of course. Uh, and be real time because uh, we're solving a business task, first of all. Okay, uh, let's discuss metrics. And um, for gender, everything is super simple. So I'm not describing uh, this here. Uh, we use just accuracy as um, most of work because most of works uh, before us uh, have been used uh, this metric. And uh, for H, also quite simple. Um, main metric usually is mean absolute error. So most of work also uses this metric and uh, we did the same. Uh, and um, addition metric is cumulative score. It can be seen as a portion of uh, predictions with uh, absolute error not higher than now. And usually L is five. It's also very clear metric, I think, and so easy to understand. Right? Okay, so what about data? Uh, not so many data sets have um, uh, age and gender ground truths uh, as, uh, as ground truths. Um, and you can see biggest data sets for open data sets for this task um, on the slide. And um, they, uh, this uh, data sets can be separated to regression and classification, the same as uh, methods. Of course, classification is much cheaper. You can mine much more data with this approach, but it's um, less precise, less strong, and uh, regression approach guides model to better generalization. Uh, one work we refer to in our paper called Deep and Balanced Regression, they have a really good recommendation for this. If you're interested, you can read the original. Um, so uh, as you can see, uh, and we, we perform uh, most of our experiments uh, on EMDB and Utica phase. And uh, as you can see, uh, not so much data and uh, EMDB is heavily based uh, to the celebrities. So this data set mostly contains celebrities. Uh, so obviously we had to mine uh, our own data. 
And we did this, uh, we collected many images from Open Images dataset, huge uh, Google dataset uh, from our production system. We have many products, so we were able uh, to do this uh, from some additional sources like uh, web scrapping and so on. And we sent uh, these images uh, to the crowdsource. We asked users uh, to estimate uh, roughly age and I, I hope not roughly uh, gender. So, and we set uh, overlap of 10. And um, we collected more than half of million of images. Uh, so after we finished, uh, raised the question, how to uh, aggregate these 10 votes into something, uh, one uh, precise uh, prediction. So with gender, everything is uh, quite simple. You can just use a mod. Uh, we did this, and uh, we also canceled, uh, we did, did decline some uh, samples with inconsistent votes like 50-50 or 40-60. Uh, so that's usually um, uh, images with bad quality, and also these crops uh, were generated with a detection detector uh, neural network. So some mistakes possible. Uh, but with age, not so. Everything is not so simple, and. Um, of course, you can use some statistical methods. You can see most of, many of them uh, in table one. Uh, and uh, you can see that a um, result at my year, uh, like 4.77, for example, isn't so high, but it's also not so good. So th this can be used for a train, but still error is quite high. And yes, we calculated uh, these results based on control tasks. Uh, we use them for uh, quality control. So we can uh, calculate these numbers. And um, there is one quite simple idea. If you have control tasks, and usually, uh, and uh, obviously some people uh, estimate age better and some worse. And a few slides later, I will show you that my uh, distributed almost normally. Uh, if we have this um, uh, Maya, and uh, we can calculate uh, them individually for each user, we can waste the votes. So we did this with an exponential term, and you can see that uh, results are much better uh, with significant margin from other methods. So three and a half, that's a really nice result, uh, I can say. So after we finished, <clears throat> uh, we collected more than uh, half of million images, and um, half of million we used for a train. Uh, it's uh, our close proprietary uh, data set. Uh, because we can share them, um, some of them from our production and uh, can be licensed. And uh, but we um, decided to create new uh, benchmark uh, from images from Open Image uh, dataset. We called it uh, Layer Age and Gender dataset. You can see statistics um, on the slide. You can see that uh, the histogram, and you can see um, uh, it's almost perfectly balanced, except the very right because it's uh, very hard to mine uh, ages. Uh, the sages obviously and um uh, we decided to create it because uh, previous benchmarks uh, are all heavily based uh, to celebrities or very small because has been taken in like police office uh, or studio so obviously they are quite small and uh, you can download this uh, new benchmark by url uh, for free without any forms so uh, you're welcome <laughs> Okay, let's move to the methods. So we started, uh, we wanted to start with some uh, baseline, uh, some strong model, so we can be sure uh, we can move on uh, to something more complex. And um, we took as our baseline Visual Outlooker. If you're not familiar with this um, network, you can read the original paper, but all you need to know right now, uh, that's a modified uh, visual transformer uh, with modified attention block. And uh, we started with uh, more, the simplest task. So face crop as input and age as output. And uh, then we add uh, another output as gender. So uh, I, I won't uh, go deep uh, here um, to train procedure. It's uh, modified slightly, of course, um, uh, compared to original uh, classification uh, model uh, because uh, we described these uh, details in our paper. And we have no so much time. Uh, let's take a look to the results. Um, so you can see that our baseline already um, take state of the art, and uh, for both MDB clean. Uh, for example, here is a previous state of the art, and uh, the same for Uchika face, and also 
um, very good results for our new Lagenda train and benchmark test set. And um, what's really interesting here that you can see that age and gender model with a double output is much more precise than just age output. Difference between these two models, just gender output. Nothing has been modified in train procedure. So that's a uh, yes, uh, well-known uh, phenomenon when model generalize better with uh, multitasks, but uh, it's, it's not so often you can observe it uh, so straightforward. So that's amazing. And you can see uh, the same for all the data sets. Uh, model with the additional output is more precise. Okay, so we beat state of the art, but uh, that wasn't our goal. Our goal was to create a model that can operate in any cases, in any combinations of faces and bodies. Uh, some of them can be unavailable. And uh, uh, so obviously we cannot use single in, si single uh, input of entire person crop because uh, s the resolution of this model is uh, very small and uh, face features will be just vanished away. So we cannot do this and we have to create some model that uh, will use multi-input architecture. And uh, what we did, so um, you can see that we separate uh, face and body crops. And uh, to perform this cross view uh, future fusion, we created future instance model. So first we pass our uh, inputs to the original patch embedding. Uh, and also very important that we need to preserve original dimension sizes because uh, otherwise we cannot use the transfer learning, otherwise our model will be slow. So we have to use some early fusion and uh, fit the same dimensions as an original. So uh, our future instance model fuse features uh, in the way you can see on the right. We do uh, cross view attention. So first we perform a face to body cross attention, then vice versa body to face cross attention. Then we concatenate features, pass them to multi-layer perceptron, and eventually we have a fusion joint representation of the same dimensions as an original. So we can use uh, transfer learning and everything else, and the uh, model is quite quite fast. Um, because of this early future fusion strategy and everything else is our original network, uh, except uh, output, of course. So let's uh, check the results. Uh, here you can see baseline at the top. Um, and here you can see our multi-input model. And uh, you can see that we achieved a significant improvement uh, for an age and also for a gender, uh, for agenda. Uh, the hardest and biggest uh, the, uh, benchmark for now, I think. And um, slightly uh, lower results for gender, but the uh, difference is so small that it's hard to say why is that this needs to be researched deeper. And what is uh, most interesting here, you can see we can um, we can use, of course, separately uh, only faces or only body inputs. Uh, of course, battle mode is uh, joint uh, face and body inputs. And when you use just a body input, model still performs quite good. For example, for an H, it's 6.66. Let's remember this number. We will need it a few slides later. And you can see that uh, for all the data sets, uh, gender uh, works quite good. So, of course, lower than with face. Of course, face uh, is the most reliable way uh, to predict H and gender, but still uh, it works and with uh, quite good accuracy. Uh, so at this point, we took state of the art for uh, every benchmark and we became interested what will happen if we will run more benchmarks. So uh, the uh, what remains not so many uh, benchmarks we can run uh, for with a regression output for an age. Uh, we tried HDB, but uh, only some old measurements um, were able, uh, available here. So of course, we easily beat. Uh, this results, but uh, much more interesting was to uh, run our model for a classification benchmarks. Of course, we cannot use uh, any trained data for our model because we use a regression, and uh, this data sets uh, has a classification uh, have a classification outputs uh, for each uh, ground truces, and um, also the ranges are different, so they define uh, these uh, classes differently. So we cannot use any trained data, but we can uh, simply map our regression output uh, cl classes ranges, of course, 
And uh, we run our model with the validation part of these data sets. And you can see that we also took state of the art for both of these data sets. Uh, you can see, for example, for ADNs, quite old data set. Uh, here is a previous state of the art for uh, gender. And you can see that uh, margin gap is uh, really significant um, for our model. And that's amazing because uh, it's um, proves uh, real, hard, uh, real uh, good generalization power of our model. And a few uh, samples from the internet. Uh, with visible face, everything is very simple. Uh, here is there less than one year. And you can see that uh, even with tricky samples, for example, here uh, quite uh, tricky hair features you can see, our model still performs very well. And also age works very well. You can see uh, even uh, when face is not available. Uh, so model performs really good. Uh, and uh, you need to remember, a mo model never seen um, samples like, for example, these two without visible faces, uh, because we trained our model on face-centric data sets, uh, because it's hard to annotate uh, data without faces. Uh, for humans, this will be super hard. And uh, we just removed, uh, our, uh, removed faces from the data during the train. So we, we drop them uh, randomly, uh, and also we, we drop, uh, dropped randomly uh, body crops. So we've never seen samples like this, and still works uh, very well. So generalization power is really good. And what about uh, human level? So of course uh, we have because we had uh, control tasks, we can calculate it, uh, and you can see that human on our uh, on average um, mean and median. You can see here. Uh, so okay, we 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 are quite quite bad at this task. You can see that Maya is higher than seven. It's it's a quite big Maya, and if you remember, our model performs uh, with uh, Maya six point sixty six even when faces are not visible. So even when faces were removed, so model can operate better even without faces uh, on average, of course, because some of annotators. Uh, uh, has a quite good Maya, like uh, four and a half, but only a few. Uh, another plot about uh, relationship of Maya and age. Uh, you can see that model uh, beat human on almost all the range, except very left. Uh, but this data was uh, created from MDB. So control task was created from DB, and uh, this uh, data set is quite hard uh, imbalanced. So just a few samples on very left and very right. And it's hard to say why is that, so it needs to be researched deeper, but uh, maybe that's because just a few samples there. So not, not, not enough data here for, for some conclusions. And uh, about speed, about performance, so original model is very fast. You can see that with big batch size on NVIDIA V100, this model can perform with uh, more than 1000 frames. Of course, our model a little slower uh, because of uh, multiple inputs, but uh, thanks for early future fusion strategy, slowdown is just about 20%, so it's still uh, very fast and uh, almost 1000 frames can be achieved per second. Okay, so uh, validation code, uh, all the models trained on open data sets, uh, demo with our full uh, closed model, and everything else uh, you can need um, is available by this URL on the GitHub. Uh, there are also our contacts. Uh, feel free to contact with us. And also we have a Telegram channel of our team. Uh, it's in Russian, but if you are interesting, uh, you can also follow us with QR code or search by name. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much, Maxim. Yeah, we have questions in the audience. Hi there, thank you for your talk. Um, I have quite a few questions. Um, maybe uh, first, like, uh, straightforward questions. So how does, does your model perform versus real state of the art, which namely a uh, NIST challenge? So, and uh, you're comparing some, uh, with some uh, baselines uh, in academia, which are not, not quite updating because uh, there is less and less data. Have you tried to send it or you plan it or you already sent and you know the results? Can you please comment on uh, that? Th thank you for the question. No, we uh, based mostly on papers with code. So we uh, took uh, all the benchmarks we can found, big benchmarks we can found there uh, that uh, reflects our real world uh, task. Uh, 
with all celebrities. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, with benchmarks, we took all the benchmarks, even with celebrities. Yeah, so we based on Paper Swiss Code mostly, and we took first place uh, for everything we can find there. Uh, choosing from something uh, big benchmarks like this yeah, okay but you're aware of this challenge right <laughs> mm -hmm. okay so the second question is uh, about the data so um maybe i misunderstood but two big chance of your data is a celebrities b uh, people wh whose age was crowdsource estimated so you don't have real uh you know age uh no I mean, you don't re really have an age, you just have an estimations from different people or from celebrities which are uh, look better than sh they should, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, so um, it's very hard to explain in a short time, so uh, much more information here. Uh, so uh, yes, again, uh, existing data sets, uh, they are usually or has been taken or in some studios or police offices. Of course, because only there you can estimate real age, uh, so they are small, and most of data sets contain celebrities, like MDB, for example, uh, for obvious reasons, because you can obtain uh, their ages. Uh, that's why we uh, use the crowdsource, and yes, uh, we, can, uh, we cannot estimate uh, real ground truth, of course, but we can uh, estimate how well uh, eventually our annotation is, and... Uh, it's uh, three and a half. Uh, Maya should be like this, uh, based on control tasks. Uh, of course, this estimation is based on control tasks uh, generated from MDB, but uh, I expect it should be even lower because MDB is harder uh, for uh, annotators, as you mentioned, because of celebrities, because they are biased very hard. So yes, we cannot obtain uh, real uh, ground truths, but uh, we expect our annotation is uh, super precise. Thanks for a uh, wasted mean strategy, because with other statistical methods, as you can see, Maya will be quite high. So yeah, okay, maybe maybe this is the last fast question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, not, not the silly spotlight. Um, uh, the question is that uh, the she use uh, you use uh, standard RMSE because it's used in some of the papers, but there are like uh, quite a few papers, and even in this niche challenge, uh, like it states that uh, it's that it makes sense to uh, have a different metric on age estimation because uh, two years difference for children or for old people is not the same as for middle aged people. So there uh, was like. As far as I remember, quite a few relative metrics proposed uh, in uh, back in 2014-15. Uh, could you please comment on that? Uh, yes, yeah, I, I agree that uh, Maya isn't perfect metric here, and for sure, uh, um, error for like two years uh, on the very left or very right are not the same. Um, and we have some um, samples with even age more than uh, 100. So it's, uh, of course, two years here is uh, not an error at all because it's impossible uh, to, to see some difference from the picture. So uh, I agree, but uh, we used something that can be used for a comparison with other works. Yes, because of that. So maybe in future we will use more advanced metrics, but because we have this plot, we can be sure that a uh, model performs quite well. You can see uh, that error grows, of course. It's, uh, it's obviously uh, sh should happen, but not so hard as, for, for example, human. Uh, thank you. All in all, really great work, and thank you for this work in data set. It's really important because there's problems with data sets right now. Thank you very much, uh, and Can for I your question. question. One comment and one question. One comment: your your uh, model by uh, using celebrities as uh, as a model isn't couldn't be right because celebrities undergo uh, regularly uh, cosmetological procedures and they are age cheaters. So they uh, <laughs> they uh, age uh, on, on the fa their face, for example, on the picture is is not a definite age. Couldn't show their definite age. The question is well, how how your uh, model um, of age definition and age regression model differs from, for example, Microsoft's and uh, in Silicon Medicine's age definition models. And what's the range of the uh, plus minus? What's the range of the right answers for your, your model, age definition model, and uh, how it differs from Microsoft's and in Silicon Medicine's uh, models? 
sorry, do do, do I uh, uh, did I get you right? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, uh, you mean accuracy of the model or uh, what? Or, or yeah, accuracy is meant. Uh, I, I I I don't have results for the model, so I can't compare. Uh, I, I never seen them, so if, if you have them, please send, and we will try to run if there is some benchmark. I don't know. So uh, I I don't know, but you can uh, use uh, our demo, for example, <laughs> if there are no benchmarks, and you can compare manually, for example. Uh, but uh, I don't know benchmark. I, I can run and compare with these uh, models. Microsoft in silicon. Okay, any more questions? Uh, it seems no. I just uh, can comment on in silicon model. I don't know. Probably they have some updated one, but I have seen a demonstration of it uh, back in 2016, I guess. And it was actually very funny because it was Alex Javarenkov who was presenting it to Skoltech president Alexander Kulishov. And Alexander Kulishov is very well known to be to look much younger than at least at that time. He was like 70, but was looking like 60 probably. And then the model output was like 82. <laughs> <laughs> so it's apparently there were issues on for the elderly people because there is probably not that much data for this like category. So, but uh, yeah, the, the same as we. <laughs> Yeah, so the very right distribution is, is super hard. I'm, uh, we're trying to solve this. Uh, we're developing the next version, and we, we try to solve this uh, now. So, yeah, that's a real mess. Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, so uh, let us thank all the speakers of this part of our session. And uh, now we have a coffee break, so we ended a little bit later, so I suggest that we take full 10 minutes, just start a little bit later, just so we have time for coffee and so on. So, well, yeah, like 15 minutes to, uh, to one, we met again. Let's start. Uh, so because every minute we have now uh, will be subtracted for our launch. So please, <laughs> let's make it try to make it brief. So my name is Eugene Sabalov. I'm replacement chair for the computer vision track. And our next talk is uh, interactive image segmentation with super pixel propagation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm delighted to present our paper titled Interactive Image Segmentation with Superpixel Propagation. Uh, this is a collaboration between PixArt and American University of Armenia. Uh, our main task is interactive image segmentation, uh, which is uh, to create a tool, a user-friendly tool, that enables users to achieve precise segmentations by actively guiding through process. Uh, let's look at some characteristics of state-of-the-art methods. Uh, they are mostly click-based methods. Uh, you, they use click user interactions. Uh, they are commonly deep learning methods trained on huge data sets. And they are designed to get 85-90% intersection over union with minimal number of iterations. Uh, here is shown uh, an example of one such method, focal click. Uh, after one iteration and eight iteration of user clicks. Uh, so to address this challenge, we, uh, we are concentrating on a method that doesn't require a training data set. And uh, we are uh, prioritize achieving, we prioritizing achieving uh, higher than 95% intersection over union precision. Uh, so let's take a look at our uh, the interface of our method, our workflow. Uh, if the first one is the user zooming, uh, user zooms into the uh, part of an image, and then this sub image gets partitioned into super pixels using ETPS algorithm. Next, user may click one or more times inside the object of interest. Uh, 
And the next step is fast testing method and arrival time redistribution, which was the main, which is the main uh, contribution of our workflow. Uh, this is the crucial step um, for uh, controlling the propagation wave super pixel by super pixel. And finally, a uh, user can utilize a slider to uh, control the overflow of the wave from outside the uh, boundaries of the object. Uh, this is a cyclic process uh, and it continuously improves uh, until it reaches an acceptable uh, segmentation uh, and user can then extract the mask for future use. Uh, Let's take a look at the user interface uh, shown in the video below. Uh, the, right part, uh, the, the right part is the final mask and the left part is the segmentation process. Uh, this example uh, achieved 9986% intersection over union in about two minutes. Uh, let's dive into the data sets we used for our experiments. Uh, we are interested in accurate image segmentations with well-defined boundaries. Uh, so that's why we use datasets with uh, reliable ground truth masks. Uh, first two, Berkeley... Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry. First two, Berkeley and Davis, are uh, benchmark data sets from other state-of-the-art methods. They are very popular. Uh, and uh, also, in addition, we added in-house logo, our in-house logos data set for uh, experiments in uh, uh, another settings, another domain. So let's take a look at the graphs summarizing our evaluation experiments. First one is mean uh, number of iterations per intersection of a union. Uh, it is worth noting that we extended our experiments up to 500 iterations instead of commonly used 20 uh, to uh, explore uh, how methods work on higher precisions. The purple line in these graphs describe our method. Other two lines are for uh, state-of-the-art deep learning approaches. As you can see, uh, the initial uh, segmentation, deep learning methods uh, reach the initial segmentation more rapidly than our method. Uh, but um, as the intersection, uh, as uh, the number of iterations increases, our method um, uh, achieves much higher uh, intersection over union over time. It is, in, in, it is improved increasingly. And also, it is worth noting that on Logos dataset, uh, some uh, methods uh, didn't even achieve 85% uh, intersection over union, uh, which can be the uh, problem of specifics of training datasets for these two deep learning approaches. The next metric is cumulative number of images to achieve certain uh, intersection over union values. In these graphs, a higher graph um, corresponds to a better performance of the method. Uh, and as you can see on all those three, on all these those three datasets, our method outperforms uh, these methods. Uh, to do such extensive experiments on huge datasets and to reduce user effort, uh, we, uh, we need to simulate the user interaction part for these methods uh, using the ground truth masks. Um, the, uh, there are shown uh, two examples of such automation process of RITM method, one of the state of the arts, and our method. Uh, the left side uh, is the segmentation process, and the right side of each video is the difference mask uh, between uh, current segmentation and ground truth mask. So, in, uh, in general, uh, we have uh, several uh, important uh, contributions to image segmentation, uh, image segmentation field. Uh, the first one uh, is state-of-the-art deep learning approaches usually achieve uh, usually achieve good segmentation in under 10 iterations. 
However, uh, it is hard to achieve a higher number of precision uh, using such methods. And uh, while slow at achieving initial segmentation, our approach outperforms these methods on high accuracy, uh, uh, high accuracy segmentations and on detailed boundaries. Our approach uh, also expects considerable user effort uh, for good results. However, it is significantly less than manual segmentation. Uh, uh, for this part, you please refer to our paper as we have limited time uh, to discuss this during this presentation. Uh, as we look ahead, uh, there, are some future, uh, there are some improvements for uh, future research. Uh, the first one is improvement of our method uh, to handle better uh, textured images, adding negative clicks uh, for the fewer iterations uh, for boundary delineations. We also plan to investigate some um, hybrid approaches using deep learning methods for the initial segmentation and to use our method for final refinement uh, to reduce overall user effort. Uh, thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions? Uh, your colleagues, do you have any questions? Because I have many, uh, so yes. Yeah, so uh, thanks uh, for the part. So um, I'm not uh, really into the field of the interactive user segmentation, but I learned about segmentation. So the first question is straightforward: like, have you compared with the segment anything model, which is like quite uh, a loud one uh, in the last uh, few months? I would say. Uh, so we did this research uh, quite uh, sooner than now, and uh, we actually didn't compare it with that method. Uh, but uh, we have compared uh, with uh, state-of-the-art interactive segmentation approaches uh, that are, and uh, our main uh, our uh, main advantage is that we are uh, we are good at higher precisions that than uh, deep learning approaches uh, yes I see and uh, could you please also go back to the slide with this you know this very good curves uh, so uh, uh, my understanding is that these clicks, they are not really user clicks, but they are some generated clicks by mm -hmm. some algorithm, right? So could it, uh, how to distinguish, uh, you know, maybe the, you know, the procedure which was clicking was not that good. How to distinguish uh, between a good clicking procedure and uh, like a good part of your algorithm? Is there a way to do it? Because it's kind of, may maybe if I click in a correct way with this, um, uh, with different model, I will achieve better results faster. Uh, so um, we have uh, used the uh, interaction automation methods uh, mainly used in our other uh, methods which is the we are taking the uh, click as the center of the, uh, the difference mask uh, the larger connected component of difference mask uh, may, uh, and we try to uh, um, get very similar uh, uh, automation as the other uh, approaches uh, like RITM or focal click. How well is your model performing on more complex scenarios like when you don't have two segmented images like this but a human from background or its hair which is not always a hard mask you should sometimes also give soft mask. Uh, the main advantage of our method is that uh, it is uh, it gives full control to user, uh, unlike uh, deep learning approaches, which can be hard to achieve the small boundary uh, delineation uh, in. Uh, as as the example you said, but our method user can uh, fully uh, get uh, full segmentation for the desired parts, because it is traditional method, not a uh, deep learning approach. Any other questions? Well, in this case, let's send the speaker again, and. Our next talk is acne recognition training models with experts. Uh, 
thank you. So I'll present the work at near cognition training models with expert. Uh, I represent the uh, Higher School of Economics, uh, and uh, we did this work with collaboration uh, with Skin Research Institute in US. Uh, so we will start with motivation. Uh, so uh, we know that acne is a huge problem nowadays. Uh, many people have it, and uh, I guess they it impacts their quality of life. Uh, they they can feel insecure about that, and so on. So uh, the doctors who who study and uh, treat this uh, disease. Uh, this uh, disease uh, are called dermatologists, and uh, they usually to uh, first to diagnose uh, and then to, to choose the procedure to treat that. Uh, they uh, use so-called uh, grading severity grading system. Uh, there are several se severity grading systems, but um, most of them are based on the all of them are based on the visual features. Uh, and uh, the majority of them are just are just counting uh, the amount of acne lesions on the uh, face of the individual and then proceed to, to give the individual the severity score. Uh, so the example of such systems are uh, AGA and GAGS. So our goal is to, to kind of uh, uh, develop our own data set with our own grading criteria because there's uh, drawbacks to the majority of the grading criteria because they only focus on the uh, acne lesion count. And uh, the second uh, uh, goal is to develop a grading, automatic grading uh, severity system. Uh, so we first start with, the, again, these issues with labeling from the point of view of uh, dermatologists. Uh, so first of all, if we if we choose two different dermatologists, uh, let them discuss what they uh, think is the right criteria, and then uh, set them to separate room, give them the same image. They will return most likely with a different score. Uh, another issue is that the same dermatologist can can give the one score on one day and another score on another day. Uh, so, uh, and uh, as, I, as I mentioned, the most, most systems are account-based. Uh, so uh, to, to illustrate that issue, so there are two different dermatologists in question. Um, and uh, as you can see that uh, the first image is a uh, red line is a uh, sorted scores of the first dermatologists and uh, the blue line uh, are the scores which are sorted according to the index of the first sort of the uh, second dermatologists. And uh, you can see like there are a lot of uh, outliers and distortions and uh, yeah, the, 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 score, the general trend is preserved, but uh, the distortions are, are there. And uh, the, the second plot uh, is a histogram of, of both scorings. So you can see like, um, you can observe uh, the differences as well. Uh, so we acquired our own all data and uh, uh, decided to to uh, to let them de determine the uh, optimal optimal guideline to to score the uh, score the images. And uh, this is uh, the, the table represents the uh, the conclusion they reached. Uh, in all together, there are uh, 600 and se around 670 images, and uh, the score is uh, real valued, no, not uh, categorical, as you can see. And uh, you can see like an, a lot of uh, different factors are taken into account uh, apart from from the counting. So after this uh, consensus, uh, the images were labeled uh, according to what was reached to the consensus, and we can see the distribution of the scores on the data set are shown as following. Uh, so later on, we'll, I'll explain why we need the additional data set, but just uh, uh, to demonstrate some facts about uh, about that additional data set, uh, it's uh, called Technis 0.4. It's open source, 
um, uh, so one thing important to mention is that uh, our data set is uh, consists consists mostly of uh, selfies taken in front of the individual but uh, this one is uh, is kind of from for, is uh, photographs for this data set are taken from different angles uh, which, uh, uh, so those angles and those uh, conditions to, to 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 take the photo are called Hayashi requirements. So in total, there are uh, 1.500 images, uh, approximately, and uh, the bounding. And uh, most importantly, the most important thing about this additional dataset is that it has uh, bounding boxes around each lesion. And uh, there are in total nine, uh, 90 thousand uh, bionic boxes, around ninety hundred. Uh, so uh, yeah, so bionic boxes distri distribution are shown here. So most images ha have uh, almost no bionic boxes, but the the more bionic boxes, the more rare such images. So examples so of this data set, you can you can tell that it was uh, the photograph was taken from. From the angle, and uh, you can see like the bounding boxes around lesions. So uh, then uh, we we uh, we choose. So since our our main data set has real valued uh, target variables, we we solve the regression problem and to evaluate the uh, the quality of uh, automatic grader, we. Uh, we choose uh, the following metrics. Uh, the first one is well known. Uh, it's uh, mean absolute year measures the absolute year for for each prediction and averages them. And the second one is uh, symmetric uh, map. So um, in short, it's uh, it's symmetric uh, a version of the just map. And uh, what it does, it's it's uh, uh, it's basically in uh, in analog for for a relative year, but uh, for uh, for the whole data set, and uh, the symmetric symmetric part is about the denominator, uh, because uh, if we in the standard MAP uh, formula, the denominator just consists of uh, of the uh, of the truth value, and it's asymmetric. Uh, it punishes more for for uh, our prediction be, being bigger than the actual target value, and less for for the case when the, our prediction is less than the target value. Uh, so this denominator is basically a symmetric correction for this metric. Uh, so uh, for for all our uh, experiments, uh, which follows after this slide, we use the following augmentation techniques uh, to to increase our our data size, observed data size. Uh, so the first uh, baseline baseline approach is just to choose some backbone uh, and that uh, uh, fully connected layer at the end and uh, get one value for for the score. So we can see the results uh, presented here. So uh, for different points, the results are different. But uh, we can see, like, while uh, we can consider that mean absolute year is more or less decent, especially for mobile net uh, v3, because our scores ranges from zero to one. Uh, but uh, symmetric mean absolute mean percentage year um, mean absolute percentage year is uh, quite quite uh, big here. So it means that for some individual images, uh, the absolute error is uh, jumps a lot. And yeah, this is a transfer learning uh, paradigm. Uh, so uh, next, we note. Uh, so we 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 think about why why we have such deviations, uh, why we ha have such results, and uh, most. So the main conclusion is that we in our main data set we don't have positional information about our acne lesions. So we have to start searching for something additional. And uh, the additional data set, which I described earlier, is that thing that we, we lacked. Uh, so uh, we, we then proceed to uh, use uh, this additional data set to build our uh, some, some sort of detector or segmentator. I guess we could call it that. Uh, but um, uh, to build segmentator, we we have to uh, 
somehow adapt our target uh, target images uh, to to the segmentation problem. So what we did is just uh, everything inside bounding boxes we just uh, uh, label as as a target pixel and everything outside as not a target pixel. Uh, this way we can we can uh, try to to build some segmentation, but uh, we, we see like uh, that the segmentation perfor performs uh, a bit worse than the uh, uh, the uh, detection model, and um, visually it looks like this. So we can see like uh, in case that the acne lesions uh, there, uh, basically for segmentation, in case there are not much acne lesions, uh, we we get the following picture, which is above. And in case there, the more the more acne lesions there are, the better the segmentation is. But nevertheless, it's uh, it's not uh, suitable for our use. And so we discard that. So for segment for detection, uh, we, uh, we train the model and the uh, yellow model, and we can see uh, on the image uh, that uh, there is a significant improvement. We can we can observe uh, correctly labeled about uh, bounding boxes around acne lesions. So using this uh, detector, we can now uh, we can now use this detector to uh, to improve upon our, our our initial baseline. So we we. Uh, uh, propose the following uh, the following uh, scheme. So we we choose detector. In our case, it's YOLO. We get the bounding boxes, and then from the bounding boxes, we simply uh, the simplest way is just to count them, and when to to build uh, about that some some classical machine learning technique uh, uh, like regressor or something else uh, like. Uh, Leading boosting and etc. But this is just one feature of regressor. So um, we found that uh, just linear regression works the best. And um, yeah, so this um, this approach produced uh, uh, an improvement. But later on, uh, we discovered that we can slightly improve upon that as well. Uh, we can introduce. Uh, uh, two more heuristic features, uh, basically handcrafted ones. Uh, so the first one is uh, just uh, uh, measures the coverage of, of our detected lesions. Uh, so basically, it's it's the total area which covers the uh, which those lesions are covering. And uh, the second uh, feature is sorry. Uh, Okay, it seems, seems like this, this old version of the presentation. But the, basically, there is a sec, uh, the second encrypted feature, uh, which measures uh, the uh, the amount of of uh, lesions which were detected in different uh, regions of of, your, of the individual phase. Uh, to do that, we split um, a phase into n by n grid and count. Uh, and count how, how many uh, boxes were detected in each uh, in every single cell of, of this grid. So this way we we acquire two features, but the uh, second uh, feature, which is called positioning, uh, basically amounts to n squared uh, additional features because uh, the grid is n by n. So uh, the proposed scheme is uh, shown shown here. Uh, so. Um, Basically, we add two, two handcrafted features, but we can now discard the uh, the count feature because uh, uh, positioning feature basically just sums up to the count feature. So its uh, count feature is just related with the positioning features, and uh, we, we we acquire slight improvements upon the results. So uh, from the initial baseline, uh, we we didn't uh, deviate much in terms of mean absolute error. It uh, still looks more or less the same, but um, still an improvement. But uh, in terms of uh, symmetric mean absolute percentage error, the we we improved uh, uh, twice from the initial results. Um, so uh, to sum up, uh, uh, we developed uh, a new uh, grading uh, crit criteria for for severity score of acne. Uh, we suggested the uh, the model to to automatically grade uh, the severity according to this criteria. Uh, we proposed uh, new encrypted features and. Um, for the future works, so there are a lot of uh, degrees of freedom to improve upon. For example, to choose the amount of cells in the grid uh, in positioning feature, the, we can vary the detectors, uh, dif use different detectors, uh, and so on. So there is a lot of room for improvement. Um, so thank you. And 
if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to answer them. Well, thank you for a beautiful talk. Uh, do you have any questions, dear colleagues? Yeah. Uh, how do you think is it possible to take into account some additional information on a person such as age? No, we don't but uh, it's a good question because certainly those uh, meta information, this meta information can, can, can probably be useful. Sure. And uh, there, there was uh, a lot oh. of talk about. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, there also, there was a, a lot of talk about uh, from uh, to take into account the race of, of the individual, uh, since uh, it's a sensitive topic uh, in, in the US. But uh, yeah, no, you, you're right. So it's better to take into account the additional features, but we didn't do that. If no more questions arise, let's thank the speaker again. Uh, thank you. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Long. And, uh, Today I represent for also for my professor Andrei Sachenko from Higher School Economics uh, University, I, and our paper is uh, learning facial expression uh, recognition um, uh, in the wide from synthetic data using uh, lightweight neural networks. So, uh, um, facial expression uh, recognition uh, is a task to classify this, this, the expression in uh, digital images or video frames into category like anger, fear, surprise, sadness, uh, happiness, and so on. So it has a wide range of uh, application like in marketing, uh, uh, in gaming, hair monitoring, or any human machine interaction, etc. And I believe this is also a very familiar topic. Um, so uh, we have um, SMI some uh, recent uh, progress in the facial expression recognition. And uh, uh, this, uh, we found that uh, uh, despite uh, numerous proposed methods, uh, the performance hasn't improved significantly uh, over the last uh, two years. This is on the effectiveness data set. And so um, this, uh, this motivates us to explore the concept of, uh, of uh, ensemble uh, a model that uh, we combine uh, different uh, single uh, idea, different single solution uh, to leverage the advantage to enhance the overall performance. So, um, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, data sets, um, I think that they another challenge that we we are lacking uh, the the data set for this task and our. Uh, for example, in the, in the right table that uh, I believe that uh, uh, this number of image uh, is not uh, mm, a, a, a big number for uh, when we compare with the number of people in in this uh, in the world. So uh, this leads to a common problem that uh, uh, those models perform well in a controlled lab environment, but uh, their performance drops significantly in uh, real life conditions. And uh, be because gathering a proper amount of uh, real life data sets is time consuming and expensive missions. And so that's uh, uh, to, to get uh, the um, um, consent, uh, uh, the agreement of uh, individuals uh, to get their facial uh, face image, uh, that's a uh, not easy task. So uh, using synthetic data sets uh, can uh, address those problem uh, because it uh, offers numerous advantages and um, primarily uh, due to its uh, is uh, of generations. So uh, that's uh, we also be um, motivated by uh, the synthetic uh, data, the synthetic data, using synthetic data sets uh, in our research. Um, so uh, in uh, our paper, uh, we, we, we use uh, synthetic data set from the learning from synthetic data set uh, competitions uh, from the further uh, workshop. Uh, uh, from the further effective behavior analysis uh, in the Y workshop. Uh, and uh, we, we use the uh, uh, LSD training data sets to train our model. Uh, uh, we use the uh, LSD validation data sets 
uh, from this competition uh, in the our validation step. Uh, also, because the test data set was not public, so uh, we have sampled some images from the uh, multitask uh, learning competitions. Um, uh, and uh, we use it uh, as the test set to evaluate our models. So um, we use the F1 score as the metric uh, in our validation step, uh, which is similar to the original uh, LSD competitions. Um, and after that, uh, we deploy our models in the JSON Nano and X device and measure the frame per seconds of our models on a random input tensors. Uh, so uh, this uh, pipeline just uh, provide a more detailed illustration of the data pre-processing using in our research. Uh, in total, we have uh, 277K images in the LSD training data sets and uh, 4.7K in LSD validation data sets. And um, because that the original image have some blur, its input size is quite small. So uh, we, we decide to have an additional pre-processing step here that we use a super resolution algorithm here to upscale and the blur the images. And uh, we run the experiment, the pilots in, in this uh, variance of uh, those data sets. So um, we don't apply any Arman um, for for the image uh, because we want to um, and we, we apply the same training uh, procedure for on the model because we want to, to have a, a fair comparison of uh, those models on, uh, on this uh, limited data set. So um, uh, in terms of uh, the, the proposed methods, uh, we have examined and um, select the, 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 the solution that were used by the top performers uh, from uh, this uh, LSD uh, competitions uh, and so uh, first uh, uh, we select the um, multitask uh, emoti, the MT emoti uh, FNES that week is uh, recently the re state of the art model on the effect net that says and the second one is then a transformer based model which uh, is well known for its advantage on uh, the generalizations and uh, the last one is uh, girls a uh, graph convolutions that uh, were used in the second solution from the LSD competitions that um, um, we propose some um, um, different uh, ensemble approaches to utilize the advantage. The first one is that we, 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 we combine the MT, uh, the, we use the backbone from the MT Emoti FNES, uh, and we use the attention layer and classification head from the DEN model. And the second one that uh, we uh, uh, that the MT emoti F net ghost, uh, which we use the backbone from the uh, if um, the MT uh, emoti F net and the uh, uh, graph uh, layer, a uh, graph convolution layer and classification head from ghost. Uh, and the last one, which is uh, just the combine of those three uh, uh, solutions. Um, so uh, in our result, that uh, um, we find that the best results were achieved by the ensemble models, and in particular that the MT emoti FNES then girls achieved the highest uh, F1 score of uh, 0 0.771 on the original validation data set, um, and the MT emoti FNES then achieved the highest F1 score of uh, 0 0.419 on the MT data set. Um, in uh, in general, that, that the results show that uh, the ensemble models uh, achieve a better result than uh, any single model on the LSD data set. And uh, the, um, uh, the ensemble model of uh, the MT multi FNES and uh, just even increased the F1 score uh, by a significant least by a uh, factor by 10%. So uh, the, uh, the similar results were, were observed on the uh, um, MTL data sets, uh, except for the most complex ensemble model from uh, the, the, the most complex ensemble models. Uh, and although this model achieved high score on, on the LSD data sets, uh, it, it failed to provide a, a high solution uh, on the MTL data sets. Uh, 
um, another observation that's uh, the ensemble of uh, the MT in multi fness and then uh, not only achieve a higher score compared to their single models, uh, but also uh, able to achieve the higher results on the MT data sets. Um, so I believe that uh, the state of the uh, MT multi fness uh, when we use it uh, back bronze, we could extract the better embedding from the data sets. And, uh, we, when we're passing this embedding better to a more complex classification hash, uh, so that uh, from dance or good, uh, we could improve the performance uh, significantly. Uh, however, uh, when we uh, perform, we compare the, the F1 score between the LSD and MTL dataset, we see that uh, the F1 score drop uh, significantly. Uh, uh, this could be due to the lack of generalization of the synthetic dataset and the difference uh, of the label distribution uh, between the LSD and MTL dataset. Uh, so um, in terms of uh, inference pick, uh, Thin the ensemble model were more complex than uh, any single models. Uh, those inference speak uh, were slower. Uh, however, while uh, the real time is around 30 FPS, we could see uh, almost uh, model achieve a uh, faster or uh, near real time speak here. And um, if we uh, uh, stop here at this point, uh, we could say that uh, maybe this spec is good for, for uh, real-time applications, uh, but uh, we want to evaluate it in a more practical condition that we we have included uh, uh, those models in a typical end-to-end -end video analytic applications uh, with a face detector, a face recognition, and uh, our emotion recognition models. And um, uh, I have uh, used it in some uh, use case from the uh, some uh, from from my work before and I think I got some positive feedback uh, but um I uh, from uh, if we look at the, the frame perspective here we see that even only one 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 face appear in the frame that uh, the the frame perspective it drop uh, less than 20 and when the number of face uh, uh, increase that the uh, the speed uh, drop very qu quickly uh, so I, I, I believe that um, there, we, there are further work need uh, to be uh, uh, conducted here to, 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 to make uh, uh, the model faster or something to bring the, those uh, models to closer to the real life applications. Uh, so uh, to conclude on that, um, the first one that um, we propose an ensemble approach that uh, combine uh, different single state of the art models uh, to achieve a better result on the facial expression recognition task. And uh, secondly, that uh, we uh, under there are some gap of F1 score between the LSD dataset and MTL datasets uh, that using synthetic dataset is still a high feasibility. And in further work, uh, we will explore our approach, uh, maybe not only in a lecture synthetic datasets, but also for all the facial expression recognition datasets. And um, the last one that's uh, seen the inference pick of uh, many deep learning models still admit the near real time requirement in a, a, a real life application that um, maybe uh, there are some further work uh, we will explore later to to make uh, our model faster. Uh, and so that's all, and thank you for your attention. Thank you for your talk. Uh, as a previous face recognition uh, uh, worker, I am, I'm, my, my heart is filled with joy when I see that the people not only uh, like you know combine the models but also implement them on the hardware and measure FPS. So. Thank you for that. Uh, do we have any questions, dear audience? Well, it seems that I have a question. Uh, I am uh, really curious, like uh, I'm not uh, familiar with the original challenge. Can you please comment on that, whether each face represents one emotion or there are some kind of soft labels because some, like, you know, maybe some face may be both disgust and anger, something like that. Mm, um, I, 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 um, I think emotion is a very complex uh, context. For example, um, I think uh, some police politicians they can uh, hiding their emotions. Uh, maybe in the in the face you don't see anything, but uh, they are feeling happy or anger, something like that. 
So I, I, I think that that depend on the, the, the maybe in term depend on the, 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 the requirement or some specific use case. Uh, I think it's, um, uh, we can develop some, some, some model for specific tasks. For example, for children or uh, for uh, in a class, high class or in a hobby or something like that. Okay, thank you. So let's thank the speaker again. Uh, and our next talk should be semantic aware gun manipulations for human face editing. Okay, uh, hello, my name is Hlusov uh, Pavel, and uh, today I will present uh, paper semantic aware generative adversarial network manipulation uh, for human face editing. Uh, uh, the present uh, study is devoted uh, to manipulation method in uh, the generated adversarial uh, network uh, Latin space in uh, context of uh, human face editing. Uh, for this uh, study, we uh, have chosen uh, several uh, unsupervised uh, methods uh, for detecting detect detection uh, semantically meaningful direction in the style again to Latin space. Uh, we evaluated uh, the quality of uh, obtained uh, direction and uh, images obtained with uh, them. And uh, also we analyze the uh, result uh, and uh, propose uh, original method uh, that allows uh, to uh, improve uh, quality for manipulation with a large uh, shift. Uh, uh, in this uh, work, uh, the style uh, again uh, to model uh, is used. Uh, this model uh, uses a style-based architecture as opposite uh, to the original architecture, where random noise is immediately transferred to the synthesis uh, network. Uh, here, a non-linear uh, mapping is used uh, that produce an intermediate uh, so-called uh, vector style. Uh, this architecture allows uh, to make uh, the variation factor more separable. In particular, it is uh, shown that uh, the uh, 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 intermediate uh, space W is better line, linear se separable uh, than uh, original uh, Latin space Z. Uh, uh, it is uh, useful uh, for image editing uh, task. Uh, uh, in uh, this um, study, we was uh, chosen uh, uh, three methods uh, for the discovery of a semantically meaningful direction in uh, the generative adversarial network Latin space. Uh, the first method is uh, based on optimization and includes uh, two main parts. Uh, the first one is uh, matrix A containing the direction in which uh, the shift is made. And uh, the second part is a constructor that takes uh, two images, original and edited and uh, try to predict uh, the direction and uh, shift size. Uh, these two parts are trained together, and the uh, so loss fun function uses uh, uh, cross entropy for the predicted shift direction, and uh, standard uh, and the mean squared year for the prediction of uh, shift size. Uh, the next uh, method is uh, based on a principal component analysis. Uh, to get the direction, we sample n random vectors uh, from Gaussian uh, distribution, fit them to the mapping network, and we obtain intermediate Latin style vectors uh, W, uh, calculate principal components on their basis, and uh, use uh, principal component as direction. And the last method uh, is a closed form of factorization of Latin space. Uh, it's uh, based on uh, the assumption uh, that uh, the weights of uh, modulation layers uh, contain uh, knowledge about of the semantics. As direction, we use uh, singular vectors of weights matrices of a uh, modulation uh, layer. For this, uh, for experiments, uh, we calculated singular vectors uh, 
four layers uh, took the average and use uh, those vectors as uh, direction. Uh, uh, as matrix, uh, we use uh, fetched exemption di distance. Uh, this matrix allows to evaluate the quality and uh, variability of uh, generated images. Uh, the next uh, matrix uh, is uh, learned uh, perceptual image uh, path similarity that allows uh, to evaluate uh, the perceptual similarity of images. Uh, in order to evaluate uh, how well uh, the target attributes uh, change it, uh, they pre-trained uh, regress prediction uh, was uh, used. And uh, the last matrix is uh, cosine similarity. Uh, um, so uh, as an example, uh, consider a shift uh, in direction associated with age change. As can be seen uh, in uh, the images, all methods uh, are able to find a direction associated with uh, an age change. Uh, at the same time, it's clear that when we perform in manipulation with uh, changes uh, both uh, in the direction of uh, decrease and increase, all methods uh, add additional attributes. Uh, such uh, glasses, uh, change face posi position, uh, hair color, and so on. But in general, and it can be said uh, that uh, the methods based on optimization show the best uh, performance. Uh, actually, uh, this is uh, confirmed uh, by the value of uh, metrics. Uh, to optimize based mass, based mass method, uh, we have the best values of Fractured inception distance, uh, best uh, values of learned uh, perceptual image path similarity, and uh, best values for other metrics. Uh, uh, during uh, the experiment, it uh, was found uh, that uh, it's uh, difficult uh, to achieve uh, changes uh, only local attributes uh, such. Uh, uh, eye size uh, at the uh, eyeglasses and uh, so on. Uh, to overcome uh, this problem, uh, we used the uh, so-called uh, layer-wise editing uh, technique. Uh, uh, in, this, uh, way, uh, in this method, uh, shift is applied only to the vectors uh, W those uh, fit uh, to certain layers. Uh, for example, uh, consider a shift in direction associated with uh, eyeglasses ads. Uh, it was uh, detected, uh, this direction uh, presented here was uh, detected uh, by optimized based method. Uh, the first row is uh, images obtained by applying uh, shifts uh, to all uh, levels. And the second row uh, shift is applied only for the first uh, two layers. Uh, and we can see that uh, in the second uh, case, uh, the identity of uh, the face is well preserved. Uh, there are practically no changes in independent attributes. Uh, uh, in the case of uh, plan uh, shifts, uh, for certain layers, uh, first of all, we get much better matrix value, especially for French at inception distance. Uh, to improve uh, the quality image obtained by large uh, shifts, uh, we developed an uh, original method based on uh, the use of extended uh, latent space of uh, style uh, Ghana 2. Instead of uh, the mapping of uh, one mapping network, uh, several are used. Uh, the number is equal to the number of uh, modulation layers. Uh, so each modulation layer uh, receives its own vector W. Initially, all mapping networks are obtained as a copy of uh, the original networks. Uh, weights of the last uh, four layers, uh, it's a hyperparameter. Uh, for each uh, mapping network obtained as a copy of uh, the original uh, mapping network. Uh, uh, 
since uh, manipulations don't change the domain images obtained by the modified generator and uh, edited uh, images uh, should belong to the same uh, distribution as images uh, generated by original generator. We minimize uh, uh, deviation in discriminatory prediction for images obtained by the original generator and the modified generator. Also, we minimize the deviation in uh, discriminatory prediction for images obtained by the original generator and shifted images. Uh, as generator, we took uh, uh, pre-trained, uh, or as discriminator, we took a uh, pre-trained uh, discriminator from original uh, I've done uh, two models. Uh, in order to preserve uh, the identity between the images obtained using the original and modified generator, we will minimize uh, learned uh, perceptual image uh, path similarity. In order to improve uh, training performance, we also minimize the norm of uh, the vector, obtain it as a multiplication of weights, matrix, uh, modulation layer, and output a corresponding mapping network. Uh, now let's uh, see results. Uh, despite the fact uh, that only the directions obtained by a closed form factorization method uh, were used in training, improving, improvements were obtained for the shifts in the direction obtained by all considered methods. Uh, for example, here is an image that's obtained by shifts may in a direction obtained by optimized based method. In the upper line, the images is obtained by the original generator, and uh, the lower line uh, images obtained by the modified generator. Uh, we can see that uh, the images in the first column uh, they are almost identical. They are obtained without applying shifts. Uh, for images in the second and third columns, uh, we can see that images obtained uh, by the modified generator uh, look uh, more natural. We have a more natural color, more natural face, uh, features, uh, as uh, well as fewer artifacts. Uh, the similar picture we can see uh, in the case when we apply uh, shifts uh, for uh, in direction obtained by PCA based method and uh, in direction obtained by a close uh, form factorization method. Uh, uh, the result of uh, visual analysis uh, are confirmed by the values of uh, the metrics. Uh, uh, below uh, presented uh, metrics uh, for directional shift uh, in directional associated with edge uh, change. Uh, it can be hypothesized that uh, the transformation of uh, the latent uh, code uh, Z to uh, extended latent space uh, using uh, proposed uh, model uh, prevents uh, the emergence of details that could uh, lead a significant quality degradation during shifts. This uh, hypothesis is supported by uh, metrics uh, value for zero shift. Uh, we observe a uh, slightly high, high uh, pressure inception distance, but the discriminator still recognizes uh, the images as uh, real uh, with the same level of uh, confidence uh, as for images obtained without uh, mapping to extended latent space. Uh, in conclusion, I can say that uh, considered unsupervised method uh, apply, can be applied for task of uh, human face uh, manipulation or human face editing. Uh, also, we can use uh, some techniques uh, to improve uh, quality of uh, change uh, editing of local attributes. And uh, the method uh, proposed in this uh, paper makes it possible to achieve an improvement in uh, the quality manipulation for large uh, shifts. Uh, thank you for attention. Any question? Thank you for the talk, Pavel. Uh, do we have any questions, dear audience?
Unfortunately, I have questions. Uh, so uh, one of my first question is uh, about uh, um, so this work is really, really, you know, style gun to based because there were a lot of because it was a uh, the best network for phase generation like for uh, for uh, for a number of years uh, and like this uh, similar methods are kind of well known but uh, it seems that you achieved uh, significant results in terms of naturalness so uh, maybe I have two questions uh, one uh, is is uh, about the disentanglement of this feature uh, can you so uh, so you kind of disentangle this uh, feature by uh, by design, uh, but uh, like, could, could they be disentangled uh, even better because some of them are still connected? For example, I don't know, like long hair and uh, gender. Uh, and another question uh, is that uh, whether uh, whether it's possible to transfer these methods to uh, like let's say a new era of generators, namely diffusion models. Thank you. Uh, about uh, first question. Uh... So we use, uh, uh, since we use unsupervised method, uh, the uh, editing really uh, change not only target attributes, but uh, independent attributes. So when we change uh, gender, usually we change uh, uh, hair size uh, also. But uh, when we use uh, so-called layer-wise editing technique, uh, we can, uh, in some cases, but not all, uh, we can achieve uh, more distinct uh, changes. And uh, about uh, the second questions, uh, in uh, this paper, we don't consider to possibility transfer this method to fusion models, but I think it's a uh, uh, goal for the following uh, research possibly mine. Okay, thank you. Let's send the speaker again. And we are approaching our final talk. So I'll present to you our uh, work on dynamic gesture recognition via contrastive pre-training on video sequences. So uh, we'll start with motivation and then the problem statement, uh, what are we trying to solve? the data sets that can be used and uh, current sort of approaches and uh, our proposed approach. Then we'll uh, show the results and uh, conclude the work with the further research. Uh, so wh what, is, what is the task? Uh, one second, I'm trying to move it. Uh, so the motivation is uh, basically to develop a system uh, to recognize dynamic hand gestures. It can be used um, in many scenarios, uh, basically mostly computer, uh, human computer interaction. We can control robots, uh, computer systems, games, uh, VR and AR applications. And uh, we can uh, translate and generate sign languages, uh, especially for uh, speech and hearing impairment people. Um, we expect to see even more applications with research and development involving this area of study. And uh, we mainly focus on human computer interaction here. Um, so the problem statement, we were basically given uh, video sequences, I mean, image sequences, and we have to um, identify what, what is the gesture class that, that's been performed in the last n frames. And n is the fixed size window that we use uh, uh, to basically identify uh, for the whole sequence and, uh, oh yeah. So the subtask here is basically a hand detection uh, because uh, given a full frame, we have to find the hand and then uh, we have to come up with a gesture class and preferably segmentation to remove uh, any other irrelevant information from the, uh, from the image. We also have to uh, recognize neutral gesture is, which is basically not a gesture. We're showing our hand, we're not doing anything. Uh, anything special that we need to recognize. And it has to be end-to-end -end trainable pipeline because uh, everyone is everyone is uh, executing uh, gestures different, differently and uh, using some other um, subsystem which is not trainable can produce noisy results and uh, 
poor solution. So the data sets that uh, we, uh, we found is uh, basically here. We'll go over them quickly. First is Cam Cambridge hand gesture data set. It's a uh, very simple data set, nine classes and only RGB image sequences. Uh, they are executed uh, on a dark, uh, on a dark background. Then there is a DHG data set. It will use it for evaluation for hand key points by method methods. And it contains uh, depth uh, images as well as uh, 22 3D key point sequences. And there's uh, 14 classes. The key point sequences are generated uh, through the Intel RealSense uh, depth uh, camera. Then the, there is Igor gesture data set. Uh, it contains RGB and depth uh, data. It's a very large data set uh, with 83 classes. And uh, the, the camera is capturing from the top of, uh, of the head. So it's an egocentric camera view. And then there is data sets uh, for dynamic hand gesture recognition systems. Uh, contains also RGB and depth data. And it, it has 27 classes shown here. Uh, the quality of this data set uh, is probably the, the highest among other data sets because every participant, every participant has uh, been trained to execute uh, the gestures and uh, they strictly follow the guidelines. Then there is an NVIDIA dynamic hand gesture data set. Uh, it basically has uh, RGB and depth and uh, infrared uh, data. Uh, an example is shown on the slide uh, and has uh, 25 classes. Gesture data set, uh, what's different in this data set, it uh, has also neutral gestures and uh, 27 classes. Only RGB data is uh, captured. <laughs> then there's IPN hand gesture data set. Uh, hand data set. Uh, we'll use it for evaluation for image-based methods. And it contains uh, RGB optical flow and hand segmentation sequences, 13 classes only. Uh, we'll not use optical flow and uh, hand segmentation uh, we'll, because we'll try to focus only on RGB data as it's uh, the least uh, noisy. And uh, we want to focus on that basically. And there's a Chalern uh, data set, uh, RGBD image sequences, uh, 249 classes. It's a very large data set. And here's the depth uh, sequences shown. And uh, Sheffield Connect gesture data set, uh, RGB and depth image sequences, 10 classes. And uh, th this data set is kind of weird because some of the classes are basically drawing some figures like a triangle show showing on the left here. And, uh, since uh, we focus uh, on human-computer interaction and uh, not really on sign languages, but uh, there are very high-quality data sets for sign languages, so we'll mention them here as well. Uh, first is uh, American Sign Language data set. It contains uh, RGB image sequences and uh, 29 classes, basically the uh, letters of the English alphabet and uh, space, uh, delete, uh, sign, and uh, neutral gesture as well. Then uh, there is the modern, new, Slovo, Russian sign, lo sign language uh, data set. Uh, it's very large, uh, very large data set containing uh, 1,000 classes, including words, phrases, numbers, and even sentences. And uh, it contains uh, RGB and uh, 21 3D hand key points, uh, but the hand key points are generated uh, through the MediaPipe uh, hands framework. Uh, so it's not manually annotated and uh, it's prone to um, inaccuracies. So we'll discuss the current SOTA approaches. And uh, as I said, we'll use only hand key points uh, and the image. Uh, pure RGB image-based approaches. First is parallel con. Basically, it, uh, it does uh, 1D convolutions applied to each key point coordinate uh, in the sequence, but it doesn't really treat uh, the sequence as, uh, uh, as the sequence. Uh, so it's unlikely to be superior uh, to 
sequence-based uh, methods like transformer architectures. Uh, and uh, the other drawback is uh, it works only on complete sequences, which is uh, not the case in real world scenarios uh, where we have to actually use the sliding window uh, because we never know when, it, when the gesture is ending. Then the DGSTA, it uh, does spatial and temporal attention uh, with the key points and makes use of uh, positional encoding. And as we'll show, this is the best approach we found so far for hang key points. Then for image-based, uh, we, we came up with the 3D ResNext 101. There is also MBIT. Uh, V2, uh, which, uh, which we'll find on the table later. And uh, here, when we say 3D, when we mean we're dealing with uh, 2D image sequences, so 2D images in time. Uh, so our proposed approach, well, what inspired us and uh, what we actually uh, proposed to do and the subtext uh, that we will solve. So we're inspired with OpenAI clip method uh, that does the following. It uh, takes uh, image and text uh, description pairs, has a text encoder, which transforms the given text uh, to a vector of size k, and the image encoder, which does the same thing, but with an image. And then uh, both encoders are trained uh, to maximize cosine similarity within the pair and uh, minimize cosine similarity uh, outside of the pair. So it's called uh, contrastive pre-training. So it also uses symmetric cross-entropy loss uh, to minimize load in both directions, uh, text to image and the image to text. The rest of the clip uh, is less relevant for our task because we'll discuss why. So what we propose is uh, to replace the original uh, image encoder with the 3D image sequence encoder because we not only have one image, but uh, a list of images. And uh, we should take a pairs of gesture image sequences and their textual descriptions. And uh, we can take a large pre-trained text encoder, uh, and which will get, generate uh, uh, the text embedding from the uh, text. And uh, we'll train specifically the image sequence encoder to produce similar embeddings uh, to text encoder in the same way Clip does it. So we we'll, we we'll replace the original classification task with uh, actually a metric learning setting. Um, so do we even need the text encoder afterwards? No, we actually, uh, it serves its role through text supervision. So during inference uh, stage, we can, um, just use the image sequence encoder and forget about a text encoder. So we can just uh, use any huge sort of model for text encoder that is trained to produce uh, uh, good embeddings for the text. And we picked a sliding window of size 32, which is uh, which should be determined specifically for every data set, and uh, it should be studied uh, to well, how to take the window size properly. So the, task, the subtasks uh, that we solve is, uh, um, yeah, we don't even need uh, the irrelevant information from the scene. So we can use a pre-trained hand detector to crop the hand and uh, uh, we can take the largest uh, visible hand that, that we say we're working with. And uh, we can also replace the irrelevant other irrelevant uh, parts of the image using uh, hand segmentation, as we discussed before. So the results that we came up with uh, for hand key point uh, based approaches, uh, uh, we can see on the table that uh, MLP and CADBUS succeed over LSTM, which is uh, which is uh, pretty interesting because uh, MLP and CADBoost uh, don't uh, treat the sequence uh, like uh, LSTM does. So uh, we, we can see the non-trivial connection between the noisy and key point in the sequence. And uh, 
image-based results. Uh, we're using IPN10 dataset, and uh, so there's C3D, and then uh, ResNet, ResNext, and uh, MV32 small. And uh, so the baseline was uh, has been chosen as uh, MV32. And this can be also substituted with the latest, uh, for example, Tierra transformer. So the conclusion, uh, we deduce that hand key points approaches are more prone to errors by design since they use uh, several, uh, uh, several subsystems to generate, for example, hand key points if we use a media pipe, for example. And then we designed a novel system that is able to recognize uh, dynamic hand gestures, can generate as well to new unknown gestures, and doesn't need to be trained on all uh, um, possible gestures due to a metric learning setting. So we combine vision and text, uh, which is in line with how we humans understand gestures, as they provide a language of their own. And uh, there's a link to sign languages here. So for further research, we uh, propose uh, the following. Current data sets have no textual descriptions, just labels, but uh, we want to use the text encoder. So uh, we probably want uh, to, to have uh, very detailed descriptions for every, um, uh, for every sequence. So we propose a large pre-trained uh, video to text model that will generate this descriptions for us. For example, uh, for a wave gesture, we can do the following. The person hand is moving from side to side with an open palm and uh, it's the wave gesture. Um, so the current data sets uh, will, will just have uh, the uh, wave uh, class, but uh, we need a detailed description, as I said. So we'll use a generated descriptions uh, as the input to our text encoder. And um, yeah, implementation of the proposed approach is left for further work. Uh, <clears throat> and it also needs ablation study uh, to uh, understand uh, what, uh, which, which parts of the system actually benefit uh, uh, the actual solution. And uh, we need to carefully study the sliding window uh, for every data set and came, come up with an algorithm uh, to, to properly choose it. And right now we just use the 32 window size. It's also important to investigate depth aware models for the task. So right now we only have RGB data, but uh, we, could, uh, we could add uh, depth data to it. So thank you for attention. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, uh, does anyone have any questions? Well, we uh, kind of actually not even slightly out of time. So yeah, I also don't have any questions. So <laughs> let's send the speaker again. Thank you. Uh, I'm the chair of today's session, and it's my pleasure to welcome uh, the speaker, Gajik. Yeah, Gajik. Gajik, sorry. Yeah, and so the talk, uh, Visualization-Driven Graph Sampling Strategy for Exploring Large-Scale Networks. The floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, today, I will present our research work uh, conducted with Irina Tirosian and Vartey Ghazarian on visualization driven graph sampling strategy for exploring large scale networks. So, uh, what are graphs themselves? Graphs are complex data structures that uh, represent pairwise relationships between different objects. And when speaking of the large graphs, it means that we have a lot of entities that might or might not be interconnected one with another. Here we can see several examples of large graphs. For example, on the left, we have uh, Social Circles Facebook dataset, which basically represents interconnection between different Facebook accounts. And uh, in graph terminology, like people 
people here or entities are called nodes and uh, the connections between them are called edges. And for example here, if people are friends together on Facebook, then they will have an edge connecting one with another. And uh, here are different uh, other graphs. For example, these two represent collaboration of different paper writers with one another. Uh, and the key thing about the graphs is that they are gaining more and more usage nowadays and we have really a lot of amount of information and they are becoming too large and too complex to apply any analysis on them and uh, especially when we talk about visual analysis with so many nodes that can grow up to like tens of thousands or even millions of nodes it's becoming quite hard to apply a good visual analysis on the graphs and so what we offer for that is actually an approach called graph sampling. It just uh, refers to selection to only some portion of the nodes and edges and not operating on the whole graph uh, so that we will have uh, less information to process and it will be much more easier to gain insights from them. But the challenge with the sampling is that we might find we must find a good way to apply it so that when applying and conducting some analysis on the sample we can actually replicate this result results back to the original graph and all the information that we retrieved will be correct. And so having that, our research mainly focuses on two questions. Uh, first is the evaluation of the existing sampling approaches that we have, like which are the state-of-the-art approaches and what drawbacks or advantages do they have? And our second question was the proposal of the novel approach that will address at least some of the drawbacks that the current state-of-the-art approaches have. And speaking of such approaches, after conducting extensive literature review, we actually identified three algorithms which uh, are more or less good at graph sampling. Uh, they are random jump sampling, random edge node sampling, and the final approach, minocentric graph sampling, is actually the best one that we uh, had. And uh, so we will now go over each of them and explain how sampling is conducted in each case. Uh, first, random jump sampling. Uh, random jump sampling is actually based on the idea of random walk. So what random walk is, it is when we randomly pick a node, meaning an entity from the graph, and just randomly start a uh, traversal with, uh, between each uh, adjacent node. Okay, we randomly visit, we can start, for example, at such point, and in, with random movements, uh, go and explore the whole graph. And so what random jump is adding to random walk? Yeah, it is actually that at each uh, step with some fixed probability, we can jump to a completely random new region. Okay, and it solves some generalization problems because if we apply like regular random walk, then we start at some point and can only move with the, uh, to the nodes that are actually connected to them uh, directly or indirectly. But with the help of random jump, we are able actually to generalize better the whole graph. But of course, as the whole process is actually uh, applied randomly, there are drawbacks related to it. Uh, and uh, sometimes, based on at which point we are starting, we might miss some important component of the graph. And so this was the random jump. Uh, the next thing is random edge node sampling, which is pretty close to the previous approach. Uh, in this case, we randomly select edges from the graphs and uh, also the nodes that form this edge. And in the end, all the nodes that we have selected, if there is also some interconnection between them, even though the corresponding edges have not been selected randomly, we like strictly connect uh, all the nodes that we have uh, picked. And so in this way, again, we are able to uh, get a very good graph sample, but but again, the main drawback is related to the fact, to the word random. Okay, again, as uh, the pro underlying process is completely random, we still might miss some important components of the graph. And finally, the last approach, as we already stated, this is the state-of-the-art approach, minocentric graph sampling. And uh, the idea of this approach is to break this selection process into two parts minority selection and majority selection. In case of minority selection, actually we are trying to first pick uh, like anomaly nodes from the graphs. By saying anomaly, we don't mean like bad thing, just the nodes that are different from the others and might contain more important information than the regular nodes that we have. And so in this case, we define four types of uh, minority structures. The first ones are super pivots. We can note one here. And what super pivots are, they are nodes with high degree, meaning node that has a lot of connections with other ones, and also with high connectivity between its 
neighbors. Okay, we can see here. So such kind of nodes marked by number one are actually called super pivots. So they are mostly important structures in the graph. Uh, the next type of minority that we have are the huge stars. We can see one here. Again, huge stars also have high connectivity, but in this case now they are forming like star-like structure, meaning the their adjacent nodes have no connectivity with one another. Uh, the next important minority structure are the rims. They are these edge-like structures getting out from the main uh, clustered component. And also we have bridges, okay, here. Then bridges just connect uh, different uh, highly connected components with one another. And so this approach is based on first selecting uh, these types of nodes from the graph. And uh, after the minority selection is complete, majority selection is being applied. And uh, majority, the idea of majority selection is very simple. Uh, all the remaining nodes that we have are being evaluated iteratively. Like all the ones that are remained, we calculate several uh, distance metrics for them. Like uh, we, we actually add them to the graph one by one and then calculate some metrics. And the node that provided the best distance metric, meaning the sample graph is closer to the original one, this node is being selected. And once we uh, actually add this node to the graph, the process repeats for all the other ones. Okay, and we can directly say that this is very computationally expensive approach because like with a greedy approach, we add all the nodes, then remove them, then simply add the best one. And then this process repeats. And uh, in fact, with MCGS, we are able to retrieve a pretty good sample, but the main drawback is actually related to computational expense of this majority selection phase because too many iterations are done. And if we have a very large graph, the process can take really long. And uh, also we have a problem of imperfect minority selection, uh, meaning that actually here we identify four main minority types, but there might be other important components of the graph that might simply be missed as the result of the algorithm. Uh, so what we offer, we actually over take MCGS as the best approach that currently exists and try to apply several modifications to it. And they are named batch major, enhanced minor, connected component, and also the ensembling of all the separate approaches that we have. Let's also go over one, each one of them. So the first modification that we applied is called batch major MCGS. It means we take the regular MCGS, but modify the majority selection phase. It actually means that instead of picking a single node at each step, the one that performs the best, we decide to take the batch of nodes. Okay, like 10 nodes uh, at each iteration. So we will actually reduce the number of iteration by, iterations by 10 times and our algorithm will become much faster. And here we can see the actual uh, results. For example, here we have Condense Matter Collaboration Network. This is actually the largest network that we used in our analysis. It represents some collaboration between uh, paper writers in the field of condensed matter physics. And here we can see that with original MCGS, like the running time of the algorithm was 79 seconds, but with much with batch selection, when we picked 10 nodes in its batch instead of a single one, we have much faster implementation and the algorithm simply runs off in 8.6 seconds. Okay, almost 10 time execution time improvement. And uh, how we picked this batch size, uh, here again, we can see some analysis applied on the same largest graph, Condes Matter Collaboration Network. And we uh, tried to sample with different sampling rates and different batch sizes, and just calculated the execution time of the algorithm in all such cases. And uh, then we decided to apply the elbow method to identify the best point, uh, the best number of the batches. And we can see that starting from number 10, like for almost all the sampling rates, uh, the execution time decrease is not that sufficient. In fact, it is getting closer to zero. So we decided that 10 is the good breaking point and the batch size of 10 will be a good solution uh, for our approach. So this was the first modification that we offered. Uh, the next one is enhanced minor MCGS. Here we try to change the minority selection process. We said that like we still, after selecting the four main types, might have important minority structures. So what we did, uh, in fact, when observing our graphs, for example, here we still see the graph of the Facebook people connected with one another. Here we can see a bridge-like structure this, with this single node between two largely connected components. And we can see that actually the regular MCGS is missing this bridge. Okay, so this bridge does not exist here. And in fact, uh, this bridge is connecting two highly connected nodes that have been included here, but the connection between them is missing. 
So we decided that the minority structures that we pick, in particular the super pivots and huge stars that we are picking, we should also include the shortest passes between them. Okay, so just once the minority selection is done, we also add the short the shortest passes between the high degree nodes and only after that the majority selection process begins and we can see that like uh, by doing our modification actually the bridge is retrieved in the given sample and one last approach that we offer is called connected component mcgs uh, well the regular mcgs performs on the whole graph it doesn't differentiate between different connected components and as we can see on this example some information can be missed for example in our original graph we have a large central component and at the top in this cloud like thing we have many small uh, connected components okay they can count like two three or four nodes and we can see that one supplying regular mcgs the central structure structure is kept pretty well, but this cloud-like thing is not retrieved because the components were too small and uh, the algorithm didn't retrieve them. So what we actually offer is to independently apply MCGS on each connected component and then uh, combine the results. And as we can see, having done that, we have a much better representation in this case. And finally, as I said, we also offer the assembling of such uh, methods. And uh, basically, we take all the possible combinations of length two and three of our approaches and combine them together, like batch major with MCGS with connected component and enhanced with connected component. And in the end, we apply all of all three modifications together. Mm. Uh, so once our approaches are ready, we needed to evaluate like the efficiency of them. For that, we picked eight different uh, graphs from, from Stanford's large network data set. And we can see varying number of nodes and edges with, again, as I mentioned, condensed matter is the largest one with 23,000 nodes almost and approximately 93,000 edges. And uh, in the evaluation, we decided to go uh, with two steps. First was quantitative evaluation, and the second phase would be the qualitative. In case of quantitative evaluation, we tried to measure by actual metrics how the sampled graph is close to the actual graph representation. For this, we picked five uh, metrics like average clustering coefficient and global clustering coefficient of the nodes. They just uh, tell some information about the general node connectivity in the graph. And uh, having this, we just calculate the distance between the sample and the original graph. We also calculate the number difference between number of connected components of the sample and the original graph. And we calculate skew divergence distance and kolmogorov smirnov distance between the degree distributions of the graphs. And having all these five metrics, what we are doing, we are actually picking all our eight graphs. Uh, and for each graph, we run each of our algorithms for uh, six sampling rates, starting from 0 0.05, which basically means that only 5% of the nodes will be retrieved up to 50%. So, and also as the, all the algorithms have implicit randomness, we actually run each one four times for the given graph and for the given sampling rate. And what we do, we just calculate the stated metrics for each one by one. And for each metric, we rank our algorithms. Meaning the one that had the least distance to the original graph will appear at the first position. And then the worst one will be the last. And what we do, we just sum up all these positions that the algorithms have gathered through different runs. It actually means that the algorithm with the smallest amount of final aggregated points have appeared at the top most times. So this is the best, appro the best approach. And what we do first, we try to, using this ranking mechanism, identify which approach is the best among the ones that we proposed. And we identified that batch major CCMCGS, meaning the com combination of batch major and connected component approaches, actually is the best one that we can offer. And it calculate it gets almost 10,000 points, but we see that it is actually in the first position. So what we did, we actually picked batch major CCMCGS and tried to compare it with the same approach with the existing state-of-the-art algorithms and here we can actually see that still MCGS leads and it's a little bit up uh, from our approach by the final number of points but the difference is not that big and also taking in account that with our approach especially with the batch major step we make our algorithm more than like 10 times faster then we concluded that this is a pretty good and sufficient result 
Uh, and so this was the first type of evaluation that we uh, performed, quantitative evaluation based on the metrics. But as was the main focus of the research was the visual analysis of the graphs, we also tried to visually compare the generated samples with the original graph representations. Uh, so we performed qualitative evaluation of the algorithms. And for this, we conducted a survey with real 100 users. And how was the survey conducted? Here we can see a sample screen that the users received in the survey. Uh, at each uh, question, like they received a triplet of the graphs and the middle graph was always the original representation of the graph. And on the left and right sides, we had like samples uh, generated by different algorithms. And of course, these samples were generated with the same sampling rate. And what users had to do, they just had to look at the original graph and then from the given samples pick like which one was better. And if the user was not able to identify like which was better, they could just mark these uh, this, uh, two sampling algorithms as equal, okay? And having done that, actually, if one algorithm was winning over the another, it was getting two points. Otherwise, in case of the draw or equality, we were giving the algorithm a single point. And so in this case, the algorithm that actually gets the most number of points will, would be, have been the best one. And we identified that in this case, in visual analysis, our approach is actually winning. And surprisingly, MCGS even dropped to the third position, uh, performing lower than random edge node sampler. So we can conclude that actually our algorithm performs pretty well and sufficient in terms of the visual analysis that the users can apply. So yeah, what conclusions we can make that we got uh, pretty solid uh, quantitative uh, results. Okay, we were behind MCGS just by a small margin. And also we got the best results in terms of the visual analysis and uh, of course the very good time complexity optimization. Uh, regarding of the future work, uh, still the problem of selecting not uh, all minority structures remains and there might be room for improvement of the minority selection process by selecting additional complex and important components. Also, we can still apply testing on the larger set of the graphs because as you remember, we picked eight graphs for the main analysis. Uh, also, we can still do potential improvements on implementation level, like still there might be room to speed up the algorithm and finally, we can really look at the application in diverse domains because graphs are really used in different domains as we saw like social networks, for example, Facebook, and it can go up to natural uh, sciences like chemistry or physics. So real applications in such domains will, domains will also help us a lot. And basically that is all. Thank you. Do you have, do we have any questions like? Yes, please. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, well, on the slide, when you showed the time complexity of the algorithm, uh, for what uh, size of network was it? Yes. yes. Uh, yeah, here we can see the sizes on the four, but I think on this metric is the largest, with Thirty-three thousand nodes and around ninety thousand pages. Okay. Uh, the details, like, last time we keyboard, but condense was the condense was really the largest one that we had. Okay. Thank you. More questions? Okay, let me ask one question. Can we go please to the slide with the uh, manual results, like human evaluation? And uh, are the points, are the sum of the points of uh, all, like all the people participated in the query or there were some kind of specific formula that was calculated to, yeah, to no, calculate just, final score? Uh, provided each algorithm like equal amount of uh, we just provided each algorithm equal amount of times to each user. They just they were just uh, shuffled randomly, and so through like all hundred results, each user was given like sixteen uh, such triplets. And if the algorithm was winning, we were assigning to its to its total two points in case of the draw, one point. And so in this way, we got to these final results on how many points each algorithm has received. Okay, thank you. And maybe you it was interesting to check, like, do people agree on the same images? Do they choose, tend to choose the same uh, representations or the, the same uh, different samplings or the same samplings? Like, have a measure the agreement how they agree on this? 
Yeah, actually, we haven't gone into much details on this aspect, like uh, whether there are some trends or something else, but I think it will be a good direction for future work that we can apply. Thank you, too. Yeah, more questions. Thank you. You said that you uh, estimate your uh, algorithms, algorithms, algorithms uh, four times each one. It's uh, too few, I mean. Or not? No, we just made several rounds because, as we said, we... Sorry. Uh, we just made different runs because algorithms have implicit randomness, especially the random edge node and random jump sampler, uh, and also the minority selection process in MCGS that is described in the original paper. Uh, just not to do, uh, like, uh, if they try to identify all the minority structures with a grid one. Uh, with a regular approach, it would take too much complexity, so they applied some modification. That is why basically everything we have has some implicit randomness. So we generated for runs like to not have only one good result and say that this graph is good. Just to get more general representation, we decided to run each four times and include it in the comparison. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. The next one is uh, Sergei Sidorov, Sergei Mironov, and Alexey Grigoriev, Limit Distribution of Friendship Index in Scale-Free Networks. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present our work titled Limit Distributions of Friendship Index in Scale-Free Networks by Sergei Sidorov, Sergei Mironov, and me, Alexey Grigoriev. So, uh, what is the Friendship Index? Uh, it allows one to measure the de degree disproportions in networks. So friendship index is uh, closely related to the friendship paradox, which says that your friends are, on average, are more likely to be popular than you. Uh, in network represented by graph, the friendship index can be calculated uh, as the average degree of nodes neighbors to its own degree. Uh, it's known that, uh, well, uh, friendship index allows to measure uh, well, mm, the direction of influence in networks and also allows to compare networks with friendship index and without friendship index. Uh, so in this presentation, we will find out how friendship index is distributed in real networks as well as social networks and in simulated networks produced the, by the Barabasi Albert model and configuration models. Also, we will estimate the share of nodes for which friendship paradox holds true or in other words, uh, for which the friendship index is higher than one. And we'll see how different are real and simulated networks. Okay. Uh, first, uh, let me shortly define some notations that would be used. Uh, a complex network is represented by a graph, which has a set of vertices and a set of edges. Quite simple. Uh, DI is the degree of node VI. And then the friendship index, uh, denoted as beta, is calculated as the uh, sum of degree of neighbors divided by the square degree of the node. Or in other words, it's the same as the average degree of neighbors divided to its own degree. And uh, we're interested in finding not only nodes friendship index, but how, uh, but uh, the average friendship index among all nodes with the same degree. Uh, this will be denoted as sine of k. Don't worry, when you'll see it again, I'll remind you what this is. So I know you, all of you are tired already, probably. Uh, OK, let's move on. Uh, as I've said, uh, we'll see how friendship index is distributed in real and simulated networks. For simulated networks, we've picked ones created by the configuration model. Uh, this model is convenient because it creates networks with a given degree power law and with known exponent of the power law. And these generated networks don't have degree-degree correlations, which would be helpful for us in the future. So uh, to create the configuration model, we need a degree sequence. These degree sequences would be obtained as n independent and ident identically distributed samples of random variable xi. Uh, and the variable, this variable C follows the power law with parameter gamma. Okay, mm, now 
uh, we'll see uh, what are the limits of average friendship index among all nodes with degree of some fixed degree. So first of all, uh, let's introduce new one and new two. These are the first and second moments of random variable C, uh, if they exist. And L0 is a slowly varying function, which in other words is a function that uh, when its argument tends to infinity, if it's multiplied by uh, some positive A, its value does not really change. So what we have here is that uh, in configuration models, uh, actually, if the uh, gamma, the exponent of the power law, is more than two, then the average friendship index among all nodes with degree k, with some degree, actually tends to nu1 divided by nu2 uh, multiplied by k, which is a constant divided by k, which is really convenient for us. Uh, we can, uh, we know this value, we can calculate it. However, when gamma is between one and two, uh, it's not so great. And uh, there, well, this uh, psi n of k, which is the average friendship index among all nodes with degree k, uh, when divided by uh, function L0 multiplied by n in this power, it tends to a gamma by two stable random variable with parameters one, one, and zero. Uh, this result is not so great because uh, what we get is uh, this uh, average friendship index among all nodes with the GK depends on n, the size of network. This way we cannot compare networks with the same size, unfortunately. Well, uh, Speaking about the proof of this theorem quickly, when case is gamma more than two, then uh, first and second moments are finite. And with the use of central limit theorem, we get the following. And when gamma is between one and two, then the second moment is infinite. And uh, with the use of uh, a stable low central limit theorem, we get the following result. Okay. Uh, this, were, this was the theorem, and now let's see uh, how friendship index is distributed in simulated networks. So we create, uh, well, so we choose a number of uh, combinations of a model and gamma, the, the exponent of the power law. And for these combinations, we create networks of size 300,000, and we'll be looking at three measures. A sample mean, which is a sum of all friendship indices uh, among all nodes with degree k, and divided by uh, the number of such nodes. And, well, sample variance, which is uh, an analog of variance for the friendship index measure, and sample coefficient of variation, defined as a ratio of standard deviation to the mean. Let's see the results. Uh, well, there are a lot of images here, but let's uh, uh, focus on some of them first. Each row here represents the results for each own network. So let's look at the left column first. Uh, here we see on these logarithmic plots, log log plots, uh, horizontally is the degree, vertically is the uh, average friendship index among all nodes with this degree. For all networks, we see that uh, uh, the average friendship index actually follows the power law with parameter minus one. I mean, it's log log plus, then it's power law. Uh, if these well, weren't the log log plots. Okay, mm, in the middle, we see uh, variances. Let's just, uh, well, skip them and move on for, for a moment. The right column is, well, one of the most interesting because at first glance it may, may look like they're uh, the same for all networks. But however, uh, it should be noted that uh, only for network where gamma is more than 2, well, 2.5, uh, you see that for nodes with all degrees, the average friendship index is, I mean, uh, the coefficient of variation is less than 0. 
because that mean this means that mean would be larger than standard deviation. Well, for other networks, for small degrees, it's higher. Okay, uh, let's move on. I uh, now these were results for simulated networks. Let's compare them for some large real networks. Uh, these are networks uh, from online sources. Uh, this, well, already uh, the data for which was already collected before us. Um, these are well networks for from different sources of different size. Let's see the results for them. Surprisingly, despite all these networks being well very different, uh, we see the similar results that. Uh, Average friendship index also follows the power law with parameter close to minus one. Uh, variances for real networks are much larger than for simulated networks, which results in coefficient of variation also being much larger. Oh, well, which makes it harder to uh, predict the values of the network. So this was purely about friendship index and its distribution. Uh, let's move closely to the friendship paradox. So as I've said earlier, friendship index is closely re related to the friendship paradox, uh, which says it, that your friends are more likely to be popular than you. So uh, one, some of the known facts about the friendship paradox is that it's uh, present in social networks. Most nodes in social networks are have friendship index larger than one, or this means that they have friendship paradox. It holds true at both individual and network levels, and last but not least, uh, the presence of friendship paradox was confirmed in some uh, random networks generated by the barabasi albert model. And uh, well, the final theorem for today, uh, for, I mean, for my presentation here, uh, we'll estimate the share of nodes for which friendship index is larger than one. Uh, actually, uh, so if random variable C again follows the power law with parameter gamma and its values begin with M, we'll we can estimate the proportion of nodes for which friendship index is more than one. We can find the bounds. So it is actually bounded by uh, one minus A1 and one minus A2. And these A1 and A2 differ in the uh, upper bounds of the inner sum. This is, they are highlighted in red. So uh, what do we do with it? Uh, here, we plot the upper uh, and lower bounds for uh, based on the results of the theorem. Uh, so, uh, you may, as you may see, uh, these the value of bounds depend on the gamma, the exponent of the power law, and m, the minimum amount of nodes in network. So he, this is a plot of uh, the bounds of kappa, which is a share of nodes for which friendship index is higher than one. Or the share of nodes uh, which have friendship paradox. And these were theoretical results. And now I show empirical results for simulated networks. So these networks are based on the configuration model. And as you may see, I will just sw switch slides back and forth. The results are quite similar. So that's nice, of course. Uh, again, uh, it depends on, the results depend on M and gamma, which was the same. Uh, one thing I should uh, mention is that, uh, well, when gamma is between one and 1.5, then, well, the share of nodes for which friendship index is uh, higher than one is, well, close to one. It means that almost all nodes have it. But then the question rises, uh, when the friendship index is not uh, equal to one, oh, well, the share of nodes, uh, for which nodes it's present, for which nodes it's not. And we'll see it uh, for real and random networks. Uh, these are 
random network networks that you're already familiar with uh, that I've shown previously. So, and here we see the distributions of uh, the share of nodes for which friendship index is higher than one, but uh, based on the degree. So for each degree, we get the share of nodes um, among nodes with these degrees for which a friendship index is higher than one or for which friendship paradox is present. And well, for all these networks, we see that for smaller degrees, a friendship paradox is present. However, for large degrees, uh, for hub nodes, it's almost never present. And also this parameter depends on gamma. If gamma is smaller, then the amount of nodes with French paradox is higher, and vice versa. Mm, okay, I think uh, that's he everything here. And finally, let's see the same for real networks. Um, well, uh, actually, the results are also quite similar. Yes, so you see the sh shapes of slopes uh, differ. They aren't so beautiful of, as for simulated networks, or you may consider them more beautiful. Well, that, so yes, uh, it also depends on uh, uh, gamma, the parameter of power law, but um, well, real networks are more complex, then the results are, well, a little bit uh, changed from the simulated networks. So um, to sum everything up, we uh, looked at the values of friendship paradox, uh, about, we looked at their distributions in the real and simulated networks, and uh, how it depends on degree of nodes. And so in networks, uh, without degree degree correlations and network size tends to infinity, we've proved that uh, power low degree distribution, uh, well, because it has a finite second moment and it, the value of average friendship index tends to a constant divided by K. However, when the second moment is uh, infinite, uh, is not bounded, then this quantity converts to a stable distributed random variable divided by this. And secondly, uh, the friendship paradox is present in all networks whose degree di distributions follows the power law. And it depends on the exponent of the power law. And uh, if the higher minimum degree is larger, then it leads to a stronger friendship paradox in network. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Do we have questions? Yes, please. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, it reminds me one interesting chapter in the proofs from the book, a uh, book by Eigner and uh, Ziegler. Uh, and this is a chapter about friends and politicians. And the theorem says that if two people have exactly one friend in common, then there is a politician who is everybody's friends. <laughs> but uh, your friendship paradox is also should be this is also should be a famous thing. Maybe it's somehow re related to this type of theorems or not. Uh, just curious. Yeah, and just adding about this moral thing that everyone knows through like some four to six handshakes. Like it also struggled my mind. Yeah, maybe comment on this. Too. Well, uh, actually, a friendship paradox uh, is a known topic. Well, it's not the well, not I who invented it, of course. And uh, usually it was uh, developed in social studies and uh, not really in uh, network uh, studies. Uh, maybe, well, the friendship index as a measure, well, this name was introduced to recently. Um, uh, about uh, your exact example, that's an interesting one. I, I can't really say if they're, it's the same or not. It's a nice uh, thing to check out, and I'll do it. Thank you. Thank you. Well. And one more technical question. You mentioned uh, that. I'm sorry. Uh, one more technical question. You mentioned a bipartite graph, and you also applied power law analysis to it, and you 
you didn't uh, how to say sort it out uh, the vertices of one part from another so it's just uh, the same uh, sample right yes. thank you thank you very much do we have more questions okay thank you let's thank the speaker again and the last one is uh, approximate density computation for OA by clustering from Dmitry Ignatov, Kamila Usmanova, and Daria Komisarova. Thank you for introducing our talk. This is the talk done um, together with uh, my former students and uh, the lab members, and also with some colleagues from Institute for Molecular Genetics uh, since our reference asked us to include some other examples where by clustering can be applied. We included this part and they are responsible for the data we are for the processing. So as for the motivation of our research, it was constantly uh, multimodal clustering. Imagine that you have data um, you can think of it as a hypergraph okay regular okay, uniform hypergraph where you have uh, several types of vertices like the offers of papers uh, marked by some tags and such a structure is sometimes called folksonomy a particular one because people use specific tags uh, to mark some resources, some data. But this is a three-dimensional case and a lot can be done in a two-dimensional case. Uh, <clears throat> so here we can find the so-called three communities. It is users that shares the same resources and mark them by the similar resources or the same resources and mark them by the same subset of tags. They are the so-called three communities or three clusters. But um, the question that we asked was, what is a good approximation of three concepts that is maximal um, triadic rectangles and such data? And we answered this question in our paper published in Machine Learning Journal already several years ago. Uh, but in 2D case, uh, we are going back to, to the case now. Uh, there are many things to do concerning the performance of similar techniques. And we use as a language formal concept analysis, which is rather a simple language, as we'll see. We have a set of objects, a set of attributes, binary relation on them, and two operators called derivation operators or Galois operators, saying that given a set of objects what are their common attributes and vice versa given a set of attributes what are the objects they, that share them all and the concept is just the unit of thoughts right as in philosophy but here it's more formal it has two parts an extent and an intent a and b all objects from a shares all the properties from b and vice versa all properties from b belongs to all the objects from a these concepts are hierarchically ordered. Let's have a look at this small world of geometric figures, equilateral, uh, triangle, rectangular, triangle, rectangle, and square. And let us consider just four properties, has exactly three vertices, two, four vertices, has a right angle, and to be equilateral, we can extract all the formal concepts, which are just the maximal rectangles in our data, and hierarchically order them by set inclusion of the first component. For example, the concept 234C, uh, 234C is just the concept of rectangular figures. It's more general than the concept 34BC, which is just the concept of uh, rectangles. Um, this is the tool to analyze real data. For example, we took all the publications on formal concept analysis 
uh, performed terms extraction or maybe we use keywords and combine them in to taxonomy terms like uh, sort of topics so in on the top of such lattice diagram we have 1000 papers about 1000 papers devoted to formal concept analysis and they are split into subtopics or sub communities of authors that write papers on formal concept analysis but on also a specific subtopic like software engineering these uh, concepts may intersect uh, the key property of lattices there is always infima the intersection and uh, suprema sort of union here it's a bit more complicated you can also analyze uh, real websites users uh, those are the visitors of hse university websites and also they read some other news um, like i don't know uh, RIA, uh, RIA news or cosmopolitan or expert.ru um, in triadic case as a source of this data we can use for example bipsonomy german uh, project where the authors can share their papers and tag them so we have triadic data but those were the motivating examples uh, we let's talk about by clustering and by cluster is the approximate version of concepts the term was coined by boris mirkin but definitely uh, by clusters were analyzed before by hartigan for example and by clustering refers to simultaneous clustering of buff uh, objects and attributes in genetics for example the objects are genes and the attributes are some tissues or conditions under which specific genes can be co-expressed so this is actually a matrix uh, where each cell is a number from 0 to 30 to 1000 plus something and here we can see that some of them are grouped because of uh, their core expressions so very large values are in red and if we consider the tissues which are how to say suspicious to, to contain uh, malignant uh, tissues that uh, they can be the source of cancer or the mark biomarkers of cancer the formal definition of bicluster is just a submatrix of an input matrix like the gene expression matrix. It's a real valued one. We'll consider only binary ones. And uh, it turns out that in bioinformatics, they rediscovered formal concepts as um, such inclusion maximal biclusters. So there are theorems. Uh, saying that but we propose something which is the relaxation of such a rigid notion when all the objects should share all the properties actually we can consider just one pair an object and an attribute maybe the gene and some condition and we can apply prime operators saying that m prime m prime is just the set of objects that share all that shares um, as an attribute and vice versa g prime is the set of all attributes which describes the object g and then we can uh, intersect such um, a rectangle with the incidence matrix and count the number of non-empty cells and this is exactly the density of such a by cluster here is an example a geometric one so gm cell is in here in the center these uh, stripes the gray stripes they are full of ones and we can find first primes so to speak they shape this bounding box but we can also find the second primes and they form this uh, green dense cross full of cells and there might be some other cells but they do not form such a cross-like uh, structure. So these black cells also belong to bicluster. 
Actually, we may think of bi-clusters as sub-lattices in the whole lattice of formal concepts of max or maximal rectangles. They have some properties, like the density lies in the interval from zero to one, and actually, uh, and actually in reality, this one is enrichable, so it's a bit larger value for a non-empty uh, binary relation. Um, and they also can be hierarchically ordered, but uh, we cannot uh, devise some efficient data mining algorithms like a priori algorithm for finding association rules or frequently both bold items because uh, this relation, when one by cluster is a is a sub by cluster of the other is not monotonic and no, no, nor anti monotonic with respect to density constraint. Okay, but we can set the density threshold to be zero and consider all the by clusters, and then the following fruitful property fulfills every uh, concept that is dense absolutely dense uh, rec maximal rectangle is contained in some by cluster. <clears throat> in terms of computational time, there are some propositions which says that the total gain uh, is polynomial versus exponential in the worst case for finding all the maximal rectangles or formal concepts. This L might be exponential. Uh, in terms of the size of G and M, uh, the number of objects and attributes, L is just the size of the lattice. Here also some example from the past. We analyzed Yahoo data set with 2,000 companies and 3,000 advertising terms. And we applied uh, object attribute by clustering for recommendation purposes. If we generate concepts with different constraints on the A and B components, that is the number of firms uh, that advertise their goods with some number of uh, keywords on Yahoo, uh, then for zero and zero thresholds we obtain about nine million concepts. This is unfeasible for manual analyzing, for example, so that's why uh, by clustering was one of the means to reduce this number and uh, when we change, when we vary the minimal density threshold, we can obtain the number of patterns which are suitable for manual analysis, and we can interpret the found, uh, the found by clusters as markets. We do not show the first component of the by cluster. They are just firms IDs, which we do not have. Um, from Yahoo, but we have the real keywords, affordable hosting web, um, hosting web and so on. This is about hosting market, uh, something about hotel market. The pattern here is very simple. The name of the city and the word hotel. Uh, we also applied uh, object attribute by clustering to scaled to binary scale data known in machine learning from UCI machine learning repository. Here are just some statistics, uh, some figures, statistics, the number of concepts uh, versus uh, the size of uh, the relation in terms of non-empty pairs. And we can also see how these numbers, the number of concepts uh, relates to the number of uh, object attribute by clusters found, and there is a drastical reduction up to several tens. SNA-related examples, uh, probably one of the most uh, famous but small uh, data sets in community detection is the so-called Southern Woman data set, about 18 women in the southern part of the U United States. In 30s, I believe, anthropologists ask them several questions, what kind of activities they share together, like going to the church or to the dinner or some party. The cross means that they participated in some event. So it results in a bipartite graph. 
and uh, we applied by clusters here and compared it with clicks as communities so you can see uh, that by clusters sometimes can capture uh, can capture larger groups than clicks due to their sparseness so here is another example about karate club uh, that fist into parts after um, after the conflict of uh, the i don't know the right word the coach and the president of the club some of the, the club members decided uh, to be with their coach, uh, the master, and the other part decided to be with the president. And there are some key persons here, like president and this master and subgroups of people that were identified with uh, clicks and with by clusters. Here I can say that by clusters are better, but they also captured uh, similar structures for um three model data we have um yeah okay for our three um, model date model data we have offers of papers um tags and we can also uh, analyze this with similar tools so the more focused result which is might be maybe not really interesting as real examples is how to compute the density of such by cluster sufficiently we were trying to use epsilon delta approximation here and chernoff hovdink inequality allowing us to use only some fraction of points uh, to estimate the density of a by cluster uh, and unfortunately this function the number of points that we should test is unbounded in the uh, most desirable points like uh, delta one the probability threshold one and accuracy epsilon zero so uh, we can at least test it in the real scenario here is a small example we have a rather sparse um, by cluster we can compute the density of this gray cross almost immediately by this formula and with the formula for n as a function of epsilon and delta this accuracy and this probability threshold we obtain that we need to test um, 10 samples we test these 10 samples and find out that among these uh, 10 samples only three uh, of non-empty cells high among them and that's why the coefficient here is 0 0.3 and this is the size of non-gray areas together we tested the approach on three data sets um, southern women zoo and advertising the greater the density of the data set the greater the accuracy here you can see where uh, in uh, in white cells where the theory agrees with experiment uh, for for which data set actually zoo data set this is for internet advertising for southern women it was not very stable uh, and here also an example from uh, from genetics where we studied ischemic stroke individuals versus non-ischemic stroke individuals and their attributes known as single nucleotide polymorphisms being attributes we found by clusters we counted uh, their density size and purity that is the number of um, individuals which are not included among the healthy ones since we are interested in finding single nucleotide polymorphisms describing non-healthy individuals which are at risk of having ischemic stroke so later on uh, these SNA descriptors are decoded to their identifiers and geneticists analyze them and uh, we are in the process to publish a paper together with them where uh, the findings are discussed with uh, with experts in uh, relevant terms to genetics so I skip everything 
which is left it's just the things which was done and can be done and i'm ready to answer your questions thank you do you have any questions yes please Could you show the slide with the complexity of the algorithm? Mm -hmm. ah, so the complexity is of linear or quadratic order? Actually, it's linear by each of the input parameter. That is the number of non-empty uh, pairs belonging to the input relation, the number of objects, the number of attributes. But here, for maximal rectangles or maximal big leaks or formal concepts, it's not linear. It looks like polynomial, but in fact, it's not. Uh, in, case, in case you have very simple um, object attribute matrix where of size I don't know, four times four, where all the crosses present except uh, the main diagonal, uh, then, am I right? Uh, yeah, that seems so. Then, um, this is G, this is M, and let, let it be N that is four, then you will have two power n patterns. So here is the complexity in terms of the input and also in terms of the output. So in the worst case, you'll have even exponential complexity. But we managed to use approximate patterns we lost some information but uh, we can use it with real data with rather large data at least thank you any more questions so if not let's thank the speaker again and this was the last talk of the session and now I invite you all to go to the main hall uh, because there's going to be a closing ceremony and we're going to announce the best paper in this track as well. So thank you all and let's go there. Thank you.